Thanks so much for being with us here on Atlanta News First Plus. I'm Joy Lim Nakarin. So we continue our coverage, our view the of Assembly Atlanta. And this is a 135 acre facility that is being built at the site of the former General Motors assembly plant. And the goal here is to create space for studio projects. Right now, more than 400 film and studio projects are produced in Georgia each and every year. And assembly will meet the demand for sound stage space. Um, you know, when General Assembly, uh, the uh, General Motors, I should say, assembly plant moved out of the area in 2008, thousands of jobs were lost. But just with the construction alone of Assembly Atlanta, two, uh, several thousand jobs have been um, created and thousands more hopefully to come. My colleague Don Shipman has more. The scale and scope of this project is massive. I think a lot of people don't really realize how transformative this is going to be. Assembly Atlanta sits on nearly 135 acres. The former GM assembly plant, now the site of Assembly Studios, housing 22 sound stages, along with production offices, warehouses, and space for TV and film productions. At the end of the day, this is a place where art comes together. What makes assembly so unique is that it's mixed use. Eventually, you will be able to shop here, have dinner here, and even live here. It's very conceivable that as you come through here at any time, they may be shooting a scene for a movie. That's why we did it. Already Assembly's owner, Gray Television, which is also the parent company of Atlanta News First, has entered into a long-term lease agreement with NBC Universal. Other movie production companies are slated to come on board too, creating thousands of new jobs for the surrounding communities. Amazing to see what Gray has been able to do. And, uh, you know, even just comparing the site today to a site, the site a year ago is just uh, phenomenal. And back here along Assembly Boulevard, you're looking at New York City, another place that movies and TV shows can be filmed. Another place right over here. This is the public park. The public can come here and enjoy this park. There's going to be an amphitheater. Music concerts will be played here. There's going to be a couple of ponds, a beautiful green space for everyone to assemble. We're at Assembly Atlanta. Don Shipman, Atlanta News First. A, a double meaning to the name Assembly Atlanta because again, it was once an assembly plant and now the hope is it'll become a place for people to assemble um, with places to, to work, to enjoy themselves and to live. You know, it's really important the context um, in which this revitalization is taking place because Doraville, many said, essentially became depressed once uh, operations shut down at the General Motors assembly plant and thousands of people lost their jobs. So many other businesses were affected as a result. The restaurants where workers ate, the coffee shops where they went, the bookstores, the gas stations. Um, and. So that's why this is such an important part of, of economic revitalization, the, the rebirth of this area in a way, this uh, recreation um, of, of life there. My colleague Adam Murphy has a little bit look at, a little bit closer look at that sort of context. In the city of Doraville, there is a hustle and bustle of traffic on Buford Highway at 285. But if you spend any time here, you'll quickly realize something is missing. Really, Doraville grew up around that GM plant, so when it left, that was a, a major loss for us. Doraville Mayor Joseph Garman said life changed here when the General Motors plant shut down 15 years ago. Hundreds of jobs vanished, and so did the people, leaving a gaping hole in the heart of the city. There was actually a lot of business that was lost. Justin Tate is the general manager of Baldino's Sandwich Shop in town. He said his store lost about 40% of its lunch business after the closure of the GM plant. There were people that would come in and say, hey, you know, this is probably my last time coming here. I'm no longer working across the street. Now, for the first time in more than a decade, there is a new heartbeat that will soon bring opportunities and life back to Doraville. But I do think property values are going to go up and we will see um, increased revenue based on that. Great Television's new development, Assembly Atlanta, will bring a new live, work, and play studio city to the old GM site, giving new businesses in town a sense of hope. We're just looking forward to more foot traffic, uh, economic growth, new jobs, 
etc. I mean, it's just a win-win for everybody. But I think the assembly is going to offer a lot of new opportunity and growth and we're really excited about it. The mayor told me that Assembly Atlanta is expected to generate more than 3,500 new jobs, more than making up for the 800 or so that were lost. The heartbeat is back and the future is bright here in Doraville. At Assembly Atlanta, Adam Murphy, Atlanta News First. Yeah, so in that context, you see how important this is for Doraville and, and what this could potentially mean for the area. Um, my colleague Maria Moreau, had a deeper conversation with Adam Murphy as he conducted those interviews and went around Doraville really gathering some context as to what all this means. Busy be out in the community reporting and I wanted to bring you on here to talk about Doraville. You know we, we talk a lot about Assembly Atlanta but this is a big moment for Doraville herself. Yeah it is. When you think about it Doraville is actually a very small community. Three and a half square miles make up the city of Doraville. But you have a lot of restaurants, you do have a lot of retail uh, in that very small area. And, you know, they took a significant hit. You heard me talk about that. There were 800 plus jobs that went away about 15 years ago when that GM plant actually shut down. It was a cost cutting measure. That's why they closed the plant. And as a result, the impact was significant on many of the businesses in the community, and they really struggled. I mean, Baldino Subs, if you've been into Doraville, that's an iconic spot, really good sandwich shop. They lost 40% of their lunch crowd. I mean, it's unimaginable if you think you're a business owner and you're going to lose half your business when a you know plant like that shuts down, losing 800 and so, so jobs. I mean... How do you survive? But they did, and many of these businesses hung on by a thread. Then they dealt with, of course, everything that came along with COVID. So this is going to be just a great rebirth uh, for the city of Doraville. They're going to see more than double the jobs come back. I mean, we're talking 3,500, 4,000 jobs that will return as a result of Assembly Atlanta alone. It's significant. And everybody there is excited. And in addition to what's happening on ground, you know, or on site there at Assembly Atlanta, you're also seeing many condos going up in the area near Assembly Atlanta, right at 285 and 141 or Peachtree Industrial. And it's just an exciting time for many of the businesses, many of the residents. Property taxes are expected to go up. So this is a win-win all the way around. And something that really puts Doraville on the map. Assembly Atlanta is doing just that. And uh, one thing that you highlighted that I loved is you actually talked to these Doraville community members, these small businesses, these people that are going to feel the impact the most. Uh, because we want to put those voices on and talk to them and see how they feel. And there was a lot of excitement for what this future has and the possibilities that come with it. Well, I mean, like I said, you talk about these businesses sort of hanging on after the GM plant left, then COVID. I mean, that was a real difficult time for any business, especially a small business owner. And now it's just, it's like the Super Bowl has come to town and it's going to stay. Can you imagine? the money that's going to be generated in the community as a result of many of these big productions that will come to Assembly Atlanta. And so when these people come to town, they have a they need a place to stay. They need other restaurants to go to. Sure, they're going to be catered there at Assembly Atlanta, you know, when they're on set. But there are times where they want to get out and they want to explore the city of Doraville and what it has to offer. So businesses are no doubt going to benefit, and so are the residents that live there. I mean, there there's a small area of residential properties, but those properties are going to get a boost because they're going to see their you know property values go up. There's going to be more tax dollars generated in the community, more money to improve roads and other public services in Doraville. So just an all-around win-win. And Adam, you are a longtime uh, Atlanta journalist, a longtime Atlanta resident for that matter. Uh, for those that aren't too familiar with Doraville, it is a small community after all, about 10,000 people live there. Uh, what should they know about this town? I mean, uh, it's already such a big deal that Assembly Atlanta is bringing a, a future for film here, but for these community members, what are some things that people who aren't familiar with this area, what should they know about the people of Doraville? Well, the people of Doraville are good people. It's got this small town feel, but it's in such a, a 
a thriving area and a big area because you're right there at 285 in Peachtree Industrial Boulevard, okay, not far from Spaghetti Junction. So while you have this city that's three and a half square miles, I mean, it's small, and there's a small town feel and great southern hospitality, at the same time, you have everything you need in this community, and with Assembly Atlanta, it just brings more to the community. And so they're in a great location. I mean, if you live or work in Atlanta, you've driven by Peachtree Industrial Boulevard at 285. We all know it, where the old GM plant used to be, and now Assembly Atlanta is going up. And so it's very convenient to get to. Uh, it's a great spot to visit. You get the small town feel I talked about, plus all of the amenities that a big town would have because you're right there on 285 at 141 or Peachtree Industrial Boulevard, as most refer to it. And I think it's just going to be a great thing. I think what's neat is when we have these big productions that come to town and they're going to come in and produce movies at Assembly Atlanta, they're going to get a small town southern hospitality feel as well as having all of the resources they need to make some of the greatest films that are going to ever be made right there in Doraville. And Adam, you are also our restaurant report card go-to. You know all the best spots. You know the spots that need some improvement from time to time. For Doraville, you are actually highlighting a restaurant report card in that the area of Assembly Atlanta. Can you tell us a sneak peek about what you're working on this week? Sure, we're doing this because it is Assembly Week and we want to give you a sneak peek of what's going on in the city of Doraville. First, we're going to introduce you to a very prime big time catering company that actually services those production crews and those actors and filmmakers that come into town and they take care of those individuals in that community when they are producing some of the great films that are going to be made here in the Atlanta area. Also, in addition to that, we want to introduce you to some really special, unique hot spots, places you want to go if you visit Dorville. So if you're in the area, you want to check out Assembly Atlanta as it begins to thrive. You'll also know exactly where you might want to go to dine. We're going to tell you about the best places in Doraville that you and I can dine at. And you get to see firsthand how these production crews and filmmakers and actors and actresses get to dine as well when they're on set. So it's going to be a lot of fun. I'll give you that much. And I'll tell you, boy, that's good because it's going to be great. Uh, we're so excited to see that. Uh, we'll ca highlight it here on Atlanta News First Plus. We know you'll have that re uh, restaurant report card for us on Atlanta News First uh, on our newscast hours. I, I just want to say for those of you that haven't checked out a restaurant report card yet, we have all of the must watch moments from Adam Murphy on our website, atlantanewsfirst.com. And check out our Instagram because you are all across town, very clearly passionate about the report cards you bring to us and highlighting all the great community restaurants that we have to check out. Yeah, Maria, we've started an Instagram post that we do every single week. Uh, it's really cool. It's an Instagram video that I produce and put together at the restaurant that we're showcasing. So you get like 25 seconds of thrill, you know, from the favorite restaurant of the week that scores a 100 and wins our golden spatula. So we'll we'll be doing that as well this week, and uh, you can you can see that pop up on our Instagram page, Atlanta News First. You should definitely watch those. They're a lot of fun and give you great ideas. And the restaurant report card segment, of course, airs every Thursday at five o'clock on Atlanta News First, and then 10 o'clock Thursday night on Peachtree TV. Adam, thank you so much. I know i got to head out the door. I appreciate you jumping on and talking with us. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. All right. All right. Thanks so much to Maria and Adam for um, that enlightening conversation, telling us all about Doraville being revitalized. So, of course, such a big part of the revitalization of Doraville. And as we mentioned, the, the infrastructure, is, a lot of it is already in place in terms of the roadways and so forth because of what it was, um, the General Motors assembly plant. Well, <clears throat> One thing that we've mentioned is the creation of jobs because thousands of jobs have already been created just by the construction um, of, of this facility. But uh, remember, thousands were lost when the General Motors assembly plant closed in 2008. It opened in 1945. Um, but it, certainly there's a lot of hope for the future, S certainly very different jobs in the film and movie and television industries um, as compared to in, in auto, auto assembly. So my colleague Abby Casores has a look at the jobs that potentially could come about and what sorts of jobs. 
It's no small feat. Building Georgia's largest production studio took countless hours of hard work. All of the steel was fabricated right here in Scottsdale, Georgia. 13,000 pieces, 12,000 tons, enough to fill 600 trucks. Every beam, truss, and column was created here at Steel LLC. Each piece is carried by overhead cranes to conveyors to saw and drill lines before getting a fresh coat of paint. Robert Miller is one of 150 employees working overtime to make the project happen. We got to put everything on there and clean it up, paint it, and get it out of here. After decades of work, he says the assembly project is one of the biggest he's been a part of. I'll tell my kids, hey, your daddy was proud of that. The company has been in business since 1947, working on the World of Coke Museum and Falcon Stadium. But Rob Williams says the assembly project put them on the map. It really just having a steady flow of work for such a long time frame, you know, it's a good sense of job security for everybody. At a time when work was drying up, they were adding workers. More than 1,000 construction jobs were added for the project, and job creation doesn't stop there. Third Rail Studios and Assembly expect 4,000 freelance jobs, including production crews, operators, and extras. This is the best place in the world to become an actor. You might recognize Brian Beagle from the film We Are Marshall. The actor is now a casting director. The movies here are huge now, so the opportunities are a lot bigger as well. Background actors average more than $17 an hour. Being cast as an extra could catapult you into stardom. It doesn't matter if you have never done anything in this industry at all. There's an avenue or a way to get into it and to learn your way and find your way. The jobs here will be good paying jobs, averaging $86,000 a year. In Atlanta, I'm Abby Casoris. Definitely sounds like some great opportunities. Um, jobs there averaging $86,000 a year is what Abby has just reported to us. Um, so what's the timeline of all this, right? Uh, of course, the construction project has been underway, but when can we expect it to all be completed? Well, that's where my colleague Chelsea Bybefore has more. Over there, it's meant to look like the French Quarter. Uh, I believe that's New York brownstone. Doraville Mayor Joseph Geierman showed us the sound stages that are nearing completion at Assembly Atlanta. Soon, they'll be used to start cranking out TV shows and movies, but long before gray television took over, the 135-acre property was home to a different type of assembly. Uh, they cr produced GM cars through their whole uh, existence, everything from the Woody to classics all the way up to modern day. The General Motors plant opened in the heart of Doraville in the 1940s. It brought thousands of jobs and people to the small town. The city really grew up around the GM plant. It, it was a really important part of the city for a long time. But in 2008, GM closed the plant and the city was left wondering what would happen and what could replace so many jobs. Six years later, a developer purchased the property for 50 million. They tore down the plant and began redeveloping the site, only to be halted by the COVID-19 pandemic. About 2020 as when we first came and walked on the site for the first time. That's when Gray CEO Hilton Howell and developer Jay Gibson entered the picture, drawing up plans for a new creative and innovative production hub. And by early 2021, specifically around April, uh, we closed on the property and then uh, we filed our permits. Gray broke ground in September of 2021, and just over two years later, construction of Phase One is almost complete. Moving forward, you know, it's a state-of-the-art production facility. Everything from lighting, grip, wardrobe, props, 3D printing, transpo, everything. Assembly Atlanta will employ roughly 4,000 people and help reinvigorate the heart of Doraville as it was so long ago. And we're joined now with our very own Atlanta News First reporter, Chelsea Bimefor. Now, we just saw that full timeline, a little overview of where we are here today with Assembly Atlanta and soon to be open to the public and here in Doraville. Uh, tell me a little bit about what it was like to put this story together. It was really cool. I mean, I, about a year ago when I started working at Atlanta News First, went out to that assembly property as it was still being built. And now to go back a year later and see all the progress that's been made, um, it's just really 
mind-blowing. I was talking to the developer in that story, Jay Gibson, that you just heard from, and I was like, this project really moved quickly. I mean, Gray bought the property in 2020, and then they broke ground in 2021, and here we are now just over two years later. It's just kind of crazy to see how fast all of this moved, especially just the the vast, like these buildings are huge, they're sound studios, they're thousands of feet long and wide and tall. Um, I think there's more than a dozen of these sound stages. The property is just massive, and to think that this has all gone up in the span of about two years is just incredible to think about. And just as you said, this property is massive. I'll show some more video that uh, you actually took uh, here in a moment. But I mean, walking around must have been really breathtaking for you and just to, to stand there and to know how much impact it's going to have on this community. Yeah, well, actually, we didn't even walk because it's so big. They put us on like a golf cart gator four wheeler thing and drove us around. Um, they gave us a big tour, drove us from all the office buildings to the sound stages to the um, there's going to be a park and a pond where the public will be able to walk through and eventually down the road um, restaurants and other retail stores. So you kind of felt like a little mouse, like in a large house with all this stuff around you. But it was a really, yeah, just neat experience to see all that. And like you said, this is going to have a huge economic impact on Doraville, on Atlanta. Doraville, if you don't know, is a really small town. There's only about 10,000 people that live there. So this is going to bring jobs to the area, hopefully bring some more people to Doraville. We spoke to the mayor in that piece that you just watched. Um, I think some of our other reporters have more in-depth conversations with him and our assembly coverage. But, you know, this is a big win for Doraville and Metro Atlanta. And speaking of the Doraville mayor, I mean, we saw some of his excitement about this project, uh, as I'm sure so many others. But you talk about, uh, you know, not just film here. This isn't just a, a new studio that's coming. This is really a move forward for Doraville, for DeKalb County. Um, during your conversation with the mayor, I mean, wh what did he highlight as was his most uh, proud moment for assembly? I think just like you've probably heard this a lot, but it's going to be live work play. So obviously huge movie studios, but it's going to be and you can see this in some of the video that we've been playing. Like there are streets that run through it right by those big facades that look like New York in the French Quarter. And there's going to be literally a public access road that runs straight through that. So I think he was just really proud of the fact that, you know, it's going to bring jobs, but it's also going to be inclusive that, you know, families can come play at the park, go to the pond, eventually hopefully get, you know, dinner, go shopping down there. Um, it's just going to be huge development for the city of Doraville. And we talk about where the what this location was before and it was a General Motors plant and now mm -hmm. becoming a, uh, Assembly Atlanta, becoming this lively working space for so many. Um, I know you're not a fortune teller but <laughs> from from what you've gathered from standing in that space that a lot of us just haven't had the opportunity to do yet, uh, what do you see in the future? Definitely job creation. I mean, like I said, you feel like you're so small in this huge space. Um, I think when we're talking to the developers and you know the the big wigs with Gray Television, they think that about 4,000 jobs will be created here um, between production and actors and um, what have you at all these these different um, opportunities that are coming down the line. But it was so, you know, maybe I'm a little bit dumb, but <laughs> I was always like, why is this called assembly? But it clicked when I did this story because it used to be an assembly line when it was the the General Motors plant many many years ago um, so I think it's kind of creative that they were able to take that history and sort of incorporate it now into the future moving forward. Uh, what are some things to look out for places uh, parts of Assembly Atlanta to make sure to check out? Yeah, so, I mean, it you know, it depends on what <laughs> the public will be able to see when it, you know, first opens, but, like, the sound stages are just massive. I've never been, well, I have been to Hollywood, but not, like, in a sound stage, so getting to see that, it's like, you just, I don't know, it's, it's so interesting to see how that all works behind the scenes, just, like, news, TV news and television, it's like you go into that other realm and you're like, wow, I had no idea how large these buildings were that they literally build little cities in and sets and stuff. So if you get the opportunity to walk through those, super cool. And then um, they were in the middle still of build, building this big pond and like a pool area where there's going to be fountains. It's just so neat. And then there's going to be a green space, which they're still in the process of building. Um, eventually all that will be open to the public as well. But yeah, just right now, it's so interesting that it, it looks like the Hollywood of the South. And we'll get a chance to see your full story later today on Atlanta News First. Final thoughts. I mean, you, you have one of the first people <laughs> 
outside of the people who made this uh, happen to see it in all of its glory and um, what can you tell us yeah I mean it's it's honestly kind of an honor when you put it that way that you know not that many people have been able to see it yet but hopefully all these stories that we're going to be bringing you this week kind of shed a little bit more light on the project and um, we've got so many angles covered literally figuratively we've got this amazing drone video that shows just how vast and wide um, this project is but it's gonna be really cool when it's all done and um, I think it'll be really interesting moving forward to see what kind of shows and movies are filmed here you know at the end they've always got that Georgia film um, sticker like when the credits roll and mm -hmm. you're always are like oh I wonder where that was filmed but a lot of that is now hopefully going to be filmed at assembly so uh, another be right reason, in your backyard <laughs> yep another reason to call us the Hollywood of the South Chelsea thanks so much for joining us thanks I'm Tori Cooper and right now I'm 51 feet so our thanks to Chelsea for that report there. Um, look, you know, we've talked a bit about the, the job, extensively really, about the job creation, the opportunities that could come from Assembly Atlanta, but it's all meant to serve, you know, television production, film production, movie production, and a soundstage is a critical piece of that. The fact that Assembly Atlanta is going to offer professional and high quality sound stages. But here's a question. What is a sound stage? Here's Tori Cooper. I'm Tori Cooper and right now I'm 51 feet up in the air. Thankfully, I'm not afraid of heights because out here at Assembly Studios, production crews are gonna have all of the amenities that we get to show you. So tonight, we're talking all about the fact that crews, when they come here to shoot a movie or just create anything, they will be able to do it on a soundstage like this. A soundstage, what is that? So a purpose-built soundstage, you know, really, is designed for the folks that come here and create content to make a workflow that's repeatable and reliable and gives us elements of control, one of which is in the name, sound. So you can tell just we were on an active construction site moments ago. We come in here and it's dead. This catwalk allows crews to control light and power to the set in a safe environment. We've got tilt panel concrete walls, so 14 inch thick concrete, and then we have uh, series of, of, of layers of insulation that go interior and on the roof and it really deadens the sound so you can't there's no echo there's no nothing in here from up there to down here you are in full control if you gotta let everyone know it's quiet on the set you're gonna use your bell and light system there are 19 different sound stages at Assembly Studios. Each one is different in size, but this one is equipped with eight different hair and makeup rooms, and there's even office space. And outside, you can be somewhere completely different. We're in the French Quarter, y'all. Take a look. This is just one of the many different facades that they have here at Assembly Studios. Down the way, there's also a facade recreating Tribeca, New York a brownstone in New York, and even a trip to Europe. And this is only one small part of the bigger picture out here at Assembly Studios. I'm Tori Cooper, Atlanta News First. Thank you so much to Tori Cooper for explaining how all that works and the magic behind Assembly Atlanta. Um, you know, part of the magic really is the costumes, right? The extensive wardrobe, what it takes to recreate these scenes from different worlds. Lana Harris has a closer look at that. You may think you love clothes. Look how amazing this is. <laughs> but Marcella Caudill is no ordinary shopper. It's so easy to get distracted by all the pieces. And this is no ordinary clothing store. We are at Cali Collection in Norcross. They have everything. Everything. Shoes, socks, jackets, dresses, accessories, shirts, belts from every decade dating back to the 1920s. I want all of these. Adele says this is basically her playground because she's okay. a costume designer. Every piece can tell a story and you can create a million different characters. Her job is to find looks for actors, whether they're security, housewives, or children in any era. So when you say teacher, you know, you see teacher. You may wonder how someone so young knows what was fashionable decades before she was born. Let's go to the 60s. Quadil says they have yearbooks and catalogs from stores like Sears, seemingly dating back to the beginning of time. Little cropped boxy tops, crochet knits, and it can kind of help you build the character. She's helped style big names like Laura Dern, Aldous Hodge, and Charlie Day, and possibly some of your favorite movies with clothes from this very location. All Eyes on Me, which was like a 90s Tupac movie. 
I worked on The Founder, which was the McDonald's 60s film, Hidden Figures, which was 60s. She says finding multiple looks for an entire cast takes a full team of people because the process is intensive. If you see an actor wearing a white t-shirt, seven, at least seven people have touched that t-shirt. But Cadill says it's all worth it watching the actors morph into their character before their eyes. It helps tell the story and become the person they need to be for the script. Respect. We are home. Black Panther. Here we go. Spider-Man. Good evening, Peter. Love it. Love it. For years, Georgians have had a front row seat to the making of major blockbuster films and TV shows. I saw Spider-Man when, um, when he went up in the air at Rainbow. Hey, could you do me a favor? Hold on to that. Does anybody fight? Let me tell you, the filming here is mega. Cardelia Hunter, the director at the Office of Film and Entertainment in Atlanta, says Georgia is Hollywood of the South for a good reason. May. In Georgia. We have at least 14 to 20 productions on the street daily. You know, we're all over the place. The Cornucopia Arena in the Hunger Games Catching Fire is really the Clayton County International Park. Remember the Oakland, California apartment complex at the beginning and end of Black Panther? Well, that's actually Wheat Street Towers right here east of downtown Atlanta. We've had uh, Captain America, Baby Driver, Ozark, The Walking Dead, Stranger Things. The list goes on and on and on. <laughs> We caught one production crew setting up to film in a fairly popular area of Atlanta. I can tell you it's Disney, and I can tell you it's Marvel. So our set is going to be right up on William Street. The secret production's location manager says Atlanta is a perfect backdrop to transport audiences around the world. Atlanta can look like LA. Atlanta can look like Miami. We look like London, New York. Um, and if you go outside of Atlanta, you'll get a little countryness as well. <laughs> Lana Harris, CBS 46 News. A lot of excitement building up here at Atlanta News First Plus as we continue to bring you our coverage of Assembly Atlanta leading up to Friday, the big unveiling, Assembly Atlanta coming to Doraville, honoring the former General Motors assembly plant that the community really built itself around and now the birth and the future of film coming to Doraville and keeping up with the name Hollywood of the South. I actually have a very special guest here. She's an award-winning actress. She's a director, producer, a total boss. Uh, Terry Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us here at uh, our first alert desk on our ANF Plus stream. Thank I wanted you. to bring you on here because you are not only immersed in film as an on-screen presence, but you sit in the chair that brings worlds to life. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to me a little bit about the beginning days and getting familiarized with the industry. Um, it's so funny. First of all, I'm going to say thank you for that boss title because I love it. Of all the titles you just listed, boss. I don't know, it just makes me flutter. Uh, so, yeah, you know, I've been in this business for a really long time, um, for over 30 years, probably. Um, started off my career in Los Angeles as an actress. Um, was always very dedicated to expanding the arts, um, an advocate for studying our craft and knowing, you know, the power of what we bring, the gift of an actor and telling stories and the characters we play, um, play a really important, important part in a lot of people's lives. And I didn't learn that until I had been on the Steve Harvey show for a few years and just the reactions and the love um, from people were always just really really, you know, kind of mind-blowing how much it mattered to to individuals, just how much it mattered to the community, us being in their homes with them weekly. Um, so I've always been really, really aware of the power of our business and, you know, and what we do. Um, and so making the move to Atlanta about 14 years ago, you know, I just, I, when I got here, the one thing that I told myself is that I want to be a part of contribute, contributing to the arts, to this platform 
platform to this industry here in Atlanta. And I wanted to bring the gifts that I had learned through all my training in um, touring with stage shows and then living and pursuing a career from um, Los Angeles. I wanted to bring those same things that my lessons and the, the way I studied, the things I studied, I wanted to bring it here to Atlanta. And so I did. You know, when I first landed here, I started teaching acting classes. I ended up uh, opening up a really cool spot called the Green Room Actors Lounge, which was like a coffee shop lounge um, for artists. We taught our classes out of there. We taught acting classes, writing classes, directing. Um, and it was just a really, it was an artist's haven. And my purpose was I wanted artists, up and coming, aspiring artists, to feel like they had a place that was home, that they had a place that they can come and get real information, that they can get, you know, uh, whatever kind of lessons in the art that they were looking for. And just being poured into, um, knowing that they mattered, that their craft mattered, if they really wanted to pursue it, that it is really a gift. Um, to be an artist and our our uh, charge is to give our gifts to the world and so that's you know that's how I kind of poured into the young artists here and it's been a beautiful thing I've seen so many who I was their first acting class and now I see them you know on TV and doing different parts and roles and it just makes me so happy and part of why we wanted to bring you on here, you know, you've had a strong on-screen presence from your time with the Steve Harvey show, mm -hmm. uh, Friday, a, a fan favorite, all of us. Um, so many uh, good shows and characters that we've got to meet through you. But you've also, <coughs> as you just mentioned, been a mentor, a director, a leader in film. And that's all been central here to Georgia as mm -hmm. the film industry continues to grow. We now have Assembly Atlanta and the birth of a space uh, where investments are being made in film film and film's future, when you hear about that, mm -hmm. like 135 acres dedicated to film production and creating an eat, work, play environment, yeah. as a director, as an actress, as a mentor uh, to future film industry workers, uh, what goes through your head? You know, I'm so excited about this space and selfishly, I'm like, I cannot wait to the opening because <laughs> I want to walk through those, uh, walk through those doors and walk through the lot and find a space for me. <laughs> It's like, where's my office going to be? Where am I going to be located on this lot? Um, but no, seriously, it's just so exciting to have something like that here. And not surprising at all because the industry has grown so much. And we've watched it kind of be built here brick by brick. And to be a part of that journey, to be a part of, you know, to be a contributing part of how the arts and how people here have taken it more seriously, that this could really be a career, that this could really be a part of our legacy of what we do here in um, film and television. And I'm excited to be a part of it. So the whole assembly thing is just, I'm like on fire. I cannot wait until this weekend. And uh, so many people, uh, you know, we, just yesterday we spoke to a casting director and so, people, so many people involved behind the scenes of uh, bringing characters to life, bringing mm -hmm. the sets and the tone, everything that creates detail in movies that really bring it into this, this world that all of us can escape to at the end of a busy day. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk a little bit about, y you know, your time directing mm -hmm. and navigating that space. Um, as a leader in film, uh, how has that process been for you and how has Atlanta been such an important place for you to, to grow in that direction? So, um, you know, Atlanta's been good to me. Like I said, when I moved here 14 years ago, I moved here here as an artist and a producer, just a new producer, just trying, knowing that I wanted to create content um, to put out into the world. But when I landed here and just the energy, I don't know, it's something about the energy of Atlanta, where if you have a dream, there are there are pieces and people in place that will support that dream if it's if you're valid with it and meaning that you you know you've done your part to study your craft 
that you've proven yourself as an asset um, in the in this particular business, um, you will get the support. And so when I moved here, one of the biggest things um, besides pouring into actors that were here, I wanted the opportunity to create content. Um, so I, along with my producing partner, Cass Seegers Beatles, uh, we started a production company called Nina Holiday Entertainment where we truly just wanted to create content that would open up doors and give more opportunities for myself and my peers um, as actors. And the more that I worked with young, aspiring actors, um, the more I just got comfortable with that bossiness that you talked about of, you know, telling people, you know, uh, try it this way or make your move here or what are your emotions there. And I was basically in my acting classes, I was basically directing these young artists. And so we had an opportunity um, for a movie that we were producing that was written by Cass, produced by us and our partner, Ricky Hughes, who also has an amazing production company, uh, Magic Lemonade. Um, we did a movie called um, Hashtag Digital Lives Matter with, with a lot of brand new Atlanta talent. Uh, it was DC Young Flies, Simone, um, B. Simone, Emmanuel Hudson, Ernestine Johnson, and they were all new to this acting world. And we produced this movie and it, we did it on a really low budget, so we couldn't afford to hire a director. And I was like, look, I've been working with this young talent. This is a comedy. It's a hood comedy. It's like all the things that um, I feel like I'm an expert at. <laughs> um, and so we took a chance on me. We bet on me. I bet on myself. And I put myself in position to direct this movie. It's my first one. And it did really well. And from that, you know, the um, executives at BT and TV One and Viacom, you know, they got they they aired our movie, and from there, that opened up the door for me to direct things on their network for them, and they started hiring me, and that has been the big build, the big journey, and that's been about eight years now or so that I've been in the directing chair and just moving up. And so many TV shows are shot here that I've gotten to direct, movies shot here that I've gotten to direct, as well as outside of Atlanta. But it all started here. And your contributions to film, I mean, have just contributed to what we're continuing to see, putting Georgia on the map, spotlighting Atlanta and its future. Yeah. Now Assembly Atlanta, uh, uplifting hopefully more film industry workers. Yeah. You know, as we talk about this unveiling that's coming just in days, Friday is a big day. Um, any message to those people that don't want to have to, you know, move necessarily to Hollywood or be in those new big markets like New York, mm -hmm. uh, that Atlanta could be a big market for them. Any words of advice if they're trying to make that leap of faith? Yeah, I just say, you know, you can't you can't win it if you don't stay in it. It you know, it is uh, the industry itself. It's a tough industry. It's it's a uh, a, a tough, you know, road. It's not easy for any of us that are in it. But if you love this, love being a part of creating content that really changes lives, that can bring people together, that can bring humor and laughter and just, you know, contribute to people's lives in whatever way that you see fit, um, you got to stay in it. And the blessing is that Atlanta still being the baby, but it's growing hugely and my hope is that you know when those big productions come into Atlanta from LA from New York that they look to hire Atlanta based crew and talent and not bring have to bring those crews here um, you know the, we're not bringing crews from Atlanta to shoot in LA or to shoot in New York they use their crew that they have there and I think it can be the same thing here we don't need to hire outside of Atlanta we 
we got it here. And so I just stay focused. You know, again, I'm a huge advocate of studying your craft, whatever that is, whether it's lighting or editing or whatever it is in this industry, study the craft so you're ready when the opportunity comes. I know I feel uplifted. Thank you so much for this conversation, for joining us here, talking about the future of film and all the excitement that's to come for Atlanta and its potential. Terry Vaughn, thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you. are going to check in live from Assembly mm -hmm. with our anchor, Tracy Hutchins, here in a moment. But first, here's a commercial break. Severe weather, Atlanta's no stranger to it. Power outages, flooded streets, hail damage, we've seen it all. That's why Atlanta News First has the largest team of meteorologists in the entire Southeast. To keep watch over your street so no neighborhood is left in the dark. Seven meteorologists giving you first alerts no matter where you are. Days before a drop hits the ground, hours before the first rumble of thunder. To keep you ready for anything, this is why we first alert. This is your home for Atlanta TV. Do not screen. over top. What are we toasted to? Life. That is glistening, by Isn't the way. Beautiful? Wow. Ah, he put my whole hand in his mouth. I'm the cougar. Trust me, tall glass of water women going home with me. Ah! <laughs> so you a man with two chicks and you ain't having fun? At all. Oh, Yes. Oh my. This is my diva day. You can't say it anymore, Anthony. What would you do? <laughs> this. <laughs> it's all local and it's all Atlanta. <laughs> Only on Atlanta's own Peachtree TV. It's a problem every night on Atlanta roads. Drivers without lights. Now you see me, now you don't. So why does it keep happening? Atlanta News First investigates, exposing a fault in many cars that's leaving drivers in the dark. It's not careless, they have no idea. Scan this code to go directly to the story and learn why every night drivers are risking it all with lights out. Excuse me, have my mic muted there. We are back here on Atlanta News First Plus and live from Assembly, you see there our Atlanta News First anchor reporter, Tracy Hutchins. You've seen her on your news, bringing in your de developing stories and the latest happening in Atlanta. Now she's taking you out to Assembly. We've been talking about it all morning, all afternoon long. Tracy, how does it feel being on this site and knowing the future that it's going to bring both to Doraville and Atlanta? Incredible. Incredible. It's, it's astounding all the work that has been, been done, done out, out here, here at Assembly, Assembly Atlanta. Atlanta. And that, and is, that the is the cool, cool thing about, about being, being here right, here right now, now is, is to see how much, how much has, progressed has progressed since then and to see the studios really kind of go up. And I'm not sure if you can see it behind me, this huge retention pond uh, between these two reflective buildings. Uh, we're at, um, of course, Assembly Atlanta, but we're in Assembly Studios, uh, this part of the property where there's a huge reflecting pool that they will start to use for production if they need to shoot any water scenes or anything like that. A lot of our first alert meteorologists, they've been out there kind of telling people about what this retention pond can be used for. So everything here really has a dual purpose, double duty. And that's what's so cool about it. Our meteorologists have been able to show people a lot of the street fronts. So it's basically a soundstage, you know, which is huge. It's massive. You could do a lot of things in there. Production studios cre create entire cities, um, create entire neighborhoods inside of these sound stages. But on the outside, in many studios, like if you go to Hollywood, um, any one of those studios out there on the West Coast, what you see is basically a flat building, a warehouse. Here, 
it serves a dual purpose because now that's a streetscape. So we have four different ones. You have Tribeca. Say if in, you're in the New York area, um, kind of that industrial look, um, European look as well. So it could be anywhere overseas in London, in Paris, um, anywhere overseas like that. And also you have um, kind of, which is my favorite, the street front that looks like the French Quarter. We were out on the balcony last week with Hilton Howell, uh, Gray Television, the CEO. Uh, Gray Television is our parent company at Atlanta News First. And we were just out there on the balcony, only two stories up, but you kind of feel like you're in a different world because you're standing out on this wrought iron curved balcony with the shutters behind you and the doors. And you do kind of feel like, okay, all we need is like a parade down the street there, and it'd feel like we were at Mardi Gras, you know, throw some beads and have a great time. So that's the cool thing about uh, Assembly Atlanta, Assembly Studios, is a lot of things have a dual purpose. Another cool thing about uh, being out here is, of course, uh, Maria, we've talked a lot about the old General Motors plant that stood here for decades and helped employ so many people. So much of what that plant stood for, and it stood here for so long. I've been in Atlanta for uh, over 20 years now, and I remember driving down 285 and just kind of seeing the property sit here vacant, the plant just kind of sit here as a skeleton of itself. Um, what uh, Hilton Hell did tell me is that once they took over this property, there wasn't anything that went unused. So even the concrete slab for the old Doraville plant, they ground it up, chopped it up. They have that on site here where they just kind of grind everything and they repurpose it. So using it for new cement for the slabs for the studios out here. Um, so that is the really cool thing about being out here now is to kind of see where things really kind of came from. Because again, when we were out here last August, one, it was extremely hot. Um, this week has been very kind of chilly, actually. Um, so a very different perspective for us. But seeing all the trees go in, the retention pond here, this building here, I don't think much of this uh, glass building, this one and the one behind us, um, kind of the two um, glass buildings. I don't think these were here, and certainly the, the facades on the other buildings weren't built yet. And the studios, um, it was they were more or less kind of frames of themselves back then. But to see all that has happened since then, it is really pretty incredible to see and uh, really exciting to be here and be part of this, you know, being in on the first part of it now. Really cool. Tracy, uh you know, as we talk about uh, being out there and taking people through this world, uh, our talented Atlanta News First reporter actually uh, have been in the Doraville community uh, talking to uh, talking to the Doraville community and seeing more of how they feel about it. And there is just excitement building up in the air. I actually want to throw it out to our Atlanta News First, Tori Cooper, who takes you inside of one of the sound stages uh, and the worlds that Assembly Atlanta is yet to create. I'm Tori Cooper, and right now, I'm 51 feet up in the air. Thankfully, I'm not afraid of heights, because out here at Assembly Studios, production crews are going to have all of show you. So tonight, we're talking all about the fact that crews, when they come here to shoot a movie or just create anything, they will be able to do it on a soundstage like this. A soundstage? What is that? So a purpose-built soundstage, you know, really is designed for the folks that come here and create content to make a workflow that's repeatable and reliable and gives us elements of control, one of which is in the name, sound. So you can tell just we were on an active construction site moments ago. We come in here and it's dead. This catwalk allows crews to control light and power to the set in a safe environment. We've got tilt panel concrete walls, so 14 inch thick concrete, and then we have uh, series of, of, of layers of insulation that go interior and on the roof and it really deadens the sound so you can't there's no echo there's no nothing in here from up there to down mm -hmm. here you are in full control um, you gotta let everyone know right it's quiet on the set you're gonna use your bell and light system there are 19 different sound stages at Assembly Studios. Each one is different in size, but this one is equipped with eight different hair and makeup rooms, and there's even office space. And outside, 
you can be somewhere completely different. We're in the French Quarter, y'all. Take a look. This is just one of the many different facades that they have here at Assembly Studios. Down the way, there's also a facade recreating Tribeca, New York, a brownstone in New York, and even a trip to Europe. And this is only one small part of the bigger picture out here at Assembly Studios. I'm Tori Cooper, Atlanta News First. Um, our Tori Cooper bringing us inside of one of these sound stages and we have so much more for you uh, out of Assembly Atlanta as we continue this conversation. I want to bring our uh, Tracy Hutchins back in. Tracy, if you can hear me all right, uh, we just heard from Tori. We are now taking it back out to you at Assembly Atlanta and there is just so much to 135 acres dedicated to building up the future of film. Oh, absolutely, Maria. And um, just kind of listening to Tori's story there, um, you know, a lot of us as uh, Atlanta News First uh, crew members have been out here kind of on the property, really trying to encapsulate all that this property can do and what it does mean for the metro area. And that's when it, what's going to happen throughout this week is showing you different parts of it because it is a massive um, property and there's so many facets to it. So not just the studio part, but also very soon there'll be a public part park and mixed use development there where everyone can kind of come out and take part. This is just right along the, the MARTA rail system so it wouldn't be that hard to hop on MARTA, come up to Doraville, get off and watch a movie in the park, a movie that was actually shot here at um, Assembly Studios and that is the big vision for this property right now. So uh, Maria, as you mentioned, as Tori mentioned too, there's a number of sound stages. What's cool about this is I had a chance to do a bit of a tour last week is the sound stages are set up and the facades um, are set up so that really everything is very close for those actors and production crews. So more or less they could go into a makeup room, get their makeup done and literally within two minutes, not even that long, um, go to you know the wardrobe room, get changed out and then walk into the set in that sound stage. All of that is just so close together. They don't have to get in a golf cart and go across the lot like some studios have because they have lots of different properties spread out all over the place, but here within a just a few minutes walk, they can do that. Now, um, Atlanta News First, Atlanta Harris, she actually spoke to some costume designers because again, part of movie making is really getting that look. And the thing about right now, how movies are made, everything is in high definition, right? And in 4K, it can't just seem real. It has to look real. It has to be real. So let's take you out to a story that Lana Harris did, really talking about the fashion um, in the movie industry and how they get all of this done. You may think you love clothes. Look how amazing this yeah. is. <laughs> but Marcella Caudill is no ordinary shopper. It's so easy to get distracted by all the pieces. And this is no ordinary clothing store. We are at Cali Collection in Norcross. They have everything. Everything. Shoes, socks, jackets, dresses, accessories, shirts, belts from every decade dating back to the 1920s. I want all of these. Adele says this is basically her playground because she's okay. a costume designer. Every piece can tell a story and you can create a million different characters. Her job is to find looks for actors, whether they're security, housewives, or children in any era. So when you say teacher, you know, you see teacher. You may wonder how someone so young knows what was fashionable decades before she was born. Let's go to the 60s. Cadell says they have yearbooks and catalogs from stores like Sears, seemingly dating back to the beginning of time. Little cropped boxy tops, crochet knits, and it can kind of help you build the character. She's helped style big names like Laura Dern, Aldous Hodge, and Charlie Day, and possibly some of your favorite movies with clothes from this very location. All Eyes on Me, which was like 90s Tupac movie. I worked on The Founder, which was the McDonald's 60s film, Hidden Figures, which was 60s. She says finding multiple looks for an entire cast takes a full team of people because the process is intensive. If you see an actor wearing a white t-shirt, seven, at least seven people have touched that t-shirt. But Cadill says it's all worth it watching the actors morph into their character before their eyes. It helps tell the story and become the person they need to be for the script.
And that was Atlanta News First, Lana Harris. So certainly costumes are a big deal. I know uh, with the movie, the Barbie movie, I know a lot of people have uh, watched that over the summer. What I didn't realize is actually with that movie um, that Margot Robbie had about, what, 40 different costume changes. I know a lot of people out there probably had Barbies when they were little. I certainly did. I think I had Barbie. I had Christy. I had some some of her sisters too, a lot of those things. So there is a lot that goes into movie making, especially when you have something as iconic as a Barbie that someone knows a lot about. All right, so when we talk about Assembly Atlanta and Assembly Studios, as we mentioned, the old General Motors plant stood in this very area in Doraville for decades and supplied a number of people with jobs. What Assembly Atlanta is designed to do is do that and much more, create even more jobs in the film industry. Um, I know we were speaking with an actress earlier, really talking about keeping a lot of those people here in our community, um, people who do design costumes, who build sets, um, production crews, all of those folks, so that we don't have to import them in. We have a lot of amazing talent in the Metro Atlanta area, and the idea is to keep them right here in Metro Atlanta and to kind of keep that money central in Metro Atlanta and in our state as well. Well, DeKalb County CEO Michael Thurman, he was actually on the Atlanta News First morning show earlier today. Atlanta News First anchor Gavir Densa spoke to him about what this means for DeKalb County, Assembly Atlanta, and Assembly Atlanta Studios. Let's, let's listen. Uh, the new state-of-the-art studio is on the 135 acres that once used to house the old GM plant here. A lot of you remember that. And we're celebrating everything assembly this week. Uh, the completion of assembly here in DeKalb County joining us this morning. We've, We've got, got DeKalb, DeKalb County, County CEO Michael Thurman. Great to have you with us. Delighted Michael. to be with you again. You, I know. We were here uh, a, a year ago yes. when we were in a big tent because all these buildings weren't here yet. Right? Just a big mud hole out there, right? <laughs> so when you pulled up, and, and I know you've been watching the progress over the last couple of years, when you see it now, I want to hear what your thoughts are. Amazing, transformational. Uh, Hilton Howell, Jay Gibson, uh, just amazing visionary leaders. And I told Hilton, it's like walking with Walt Disney in the early 1940s. This changes everything, not just in DeKalb County, but this represents a gravitational shift Mm -hmm. in the film and production industry uh, here to DeKalb County. Things will never so be the same. So is this what we're seeing? You know, it's interesting because we, we hear about how a lot of even universities and colleges are now offering classes, getting the next generation ready for the film and TV industry. They don't have to go, any, they don't have to go out of state anymore, do they? Not anymore. And 4,000 jobs right. here at this site that's directly created, mm -hmm. indirectly tens of thousands of others. These are huge career opportunities for current and future generations of Georgians. It's, uh, it's kind of full circle for you because you were labor commissioner back yes. when the plant here in Doraville that used to sit on this site closed. You were here when that closing happened. So it's almost like an arc, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I can remember the disappointment and heartbreak with generations of Georgians that worked at the Doraville plant. We closed it. But it's been a phoenix, a transformation, a rebirth of economic opportunity and development right here on this site. And I'm just proud that DeKalb County, Doraville, working with Hilton Howe and Great Communications have been able to build this partnership, public and private, right. to create jobs. Let me ask you a little bit, Michael Thorman, about, because I know, I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I've, I've seen what happened to Nashville. It's booming, yes, right? Yes, But at the same time, you've got you to gotta have infrastructure. You've got to have all those things that come along with that boom. What does DeKalb County need to do now to really prepare for the influx of the thousands of jobs that are going to be created? Are you planning ahead? Great question, Gavir. First of all, we made the investment here, mm -hmm. uh, roughly $190 million just to support the infrastructure for this multi-billion dollar effort. Right. But we have to continue to invest in our water and sewer system, in our roads and streets. Look at this site. One of the reasons this is so phenomenal, mm -hmm. you have uh, assembly here, but you have MARTER, right. uh, a station, 285, the Department of Transportation invested nearly a billion dollars in upgrading 285 with express lanes and just a thong's throw from PDK Airport and Hartsfield. That's infrastructure. You can't build above ground unless you invest underground. 
Well, we're going to see what happens. Speaking of 285, I got stuck in some of that traffic and that construction this morning on the way to work. But. More like, I did too, actually. I was worried. Oh. I said, Gavir will fuss at me if I'm late. So we were weaving in and out right, of right, trying right. to get here for it's you. It's short-term pain for long-term gain, right? All right. Uh, listen, a year from now, this thing's not even going to look anything like it does now. It's going to be even bigger and better. Michael Thurman, CEO of DeKalb County, thank you so much for joining us. And And that, and that was, was the news first morning anchor Gavir Densa talking to um, DeKalb County CEO Michael Thurman, certainly about the development here in Doraville and what Assembly Atlanta and the Assembly Studios were mean will mean for this community. As he mentioned, a gaping hole left behind when the old GM um, plant was closed down. And when you think about movie studios this is essentially like a small city you need infrastructure to go along with that of course people need to eat they need to shop they need to do all those things we'll have people moving here to be part of this industry and that hopefully will be a big infusion of economic dollars into Doraville and this community. It really already has had a great impact. We want to head out to um, Adam Murphy. He was able to spend some time in Doraville speaking to shop owners and speaking to a lot of folks about what Assembly Atlanta, Assembly Studios will mean for them and how it will fill the gap that General Motors left behind. In the city of Doraville, there is a hustle and bustle of traffic on Buford Highway at 285. But if you spend any time here, you'll quickly realize something is missing. Really, Doraville grew up around that GM plant, so when it left, that was a, a major loss for us. Doraville Mayor Joseph Garman said life changed here when the General Motors plant shut down 15 years ago. Hundreds of jobs vanished, and so did the people, leaving a gaping hole in the heart of the city. There was actually a lot of business that was lost. Justin Tate is the general manager of Baldino's Sandwich Shop in town. He said his store lost about 40% of its lunch business after the closure of the GM plant. There were people that would come in and say, hey, you know, this is probably my last time coming here. I'm no longer working across the street. Now, for the first time in more than a decade, there is a new heartbeat that will soon bring opportunities and life back to Doraville. But I do think property values are going to go up and we will see um, increased revenue based on that. Great Television's new development, Assembly Atlanta, will bring a new live, work, and play studio city to the old GM site, giving new businesses in town a sense of hope. We're just looking forward to more foot traffic, uh, economic growth, new jobs, etc. I mean, it's just a win-win for everybody. But I think the Assembly is going to offer a lot of new opportunity and growth and we're really excited about it. The mayor told me that Assembly Atlanta is expected to generate more than 3,500 new jobs, more than making up for the 800 or so that were lost. The heartbeat is back and the future is bright here in Doraville. At Assembly Atlanta, Adam Murphy, Atlanta News First. So we can see how all of this will really add up and make a difference in Doraville. And of course, when we talk about infrastructure and places for folks to shop and eat, well, now they need a place to live as well. And as we know, in the metro Atlanta area, we have seen housing costs just skyrocket over the last couple of years. Um, but we want to talk about what's going on in Doraville. And for that, Atlanta News First, Brittany Ford, she really takes a closer look at, you know, how many new homes will be available for the people who start to work for Assembly Atlanta and Assembly Studios. And if the price of housing will go up because of all this added infrastructure. We had the cabinets um, and the countertops replaced about Doraville homeowner who just put her home on the market. Her thoughts on the long-awaited assembly studio nearing its completion. Well, it's interesting because we've been watching that for years and we've been hearing all kinds of exciting things that were coming. And while she's selling for a little bit more space, it's properties like hers that will soon be in high demand. I think the market definitely will boom. If anything, it will increase and help the economic growth here because this particular studio is going to bring multiple drives to the area. 
Erica Canada is a realtor with Atlanta Communities Real Estate. This area is still pretty popular. This is a very nice established neighborhood. Canada says homes in Doraville are currently going for two hundred to $600,000. She says the attraction will increase home values, but it also comes with a setback. So we need more homes. <laughs> high demand and low inventory and what is anticipated to be more people looking to rent than buy. Canada says developers are capitalizing on that very thing. Around the area of Doraville, there is a lot of new developments. We have some new construction in Tucker. We have some new construction that's happening in Brookhaven. Empty plots like these will soon look like this with several apartment complexes taking shape throughout the area. As the studio is set to bring all the buzz to Doraville. I think it's great, you know, something productive wants to happen there. Queen, who is staying in the area, is looking forward to what's to come. Kind of got a little bit of a wait and see mentality. Brittany Ford, Atlanta News First. So the vision for Assembly Atlanta and Assembly Studios to really put an emphasis on Metro Atlanta and Georgia as well and all that we have to offer here. Uh, Gray Television CEO Hilton Hell told me, you know, he really wanted to show people what our state has to offer because he loves this area so much, loves Atlanta, loves the state of Georgia. So when we talk about that, of course, with um, these production studios here, a lot of job opportunities. Um, a lot of the steel that was used to build uh, assembly studios here, it came from Georgia. So the question is now, how many more construction jobs will this help create? And what other jobs could there be available once these studios really are fully operational? Let's head out to Abby Kasouris when she's talking about recruiting and also a lot of jobs across our state. No small feat. Building Georgia's largest production studio took countless hours of hard work. All of the steel was fabricated right here in Scottsdale, Georgia. 13,000 pieces, 12,000 tons, enough to fill 600 trucks. Every beam, truss, and column was created here at Steel LLC. In Each piece is carried by overhead cranes to conveyors to saw and drill lines before getting a fresh coat of paint. Robert Miller is one of 150 employees working overtime to make the project happen. We got to put everything on there and clean it up, paint it, and get it out of here. After decades of work, he says the assembly project is one of the biggest he's been a part of. I'll tell my kids, hey, your daddy was proud of that. The company has been in business since 1947, working on the World of Coke Museum and Falcon Stadium, but Rob Williams says the assembly project put them on the map. It really just having a steady flow of work for such a long time frame. You know, it's, it's a good sense of job security for everybody. At a time when work was drying up, they were adding workers. More than 1,000 construction jobs were added for the project, and job creation doesn't stop there. Third Rail Studios and Assembly expect 4,000 freelance jobs, including production crews, operators, and extras. This is the best place in the world to become an actor. You might recognize Brian Beagle from the film We Are Marshall. The actor is now a casting director. The movies here are huge now, so the opportunities are a lot bigger as well. Background actors average more than $17 an hour. Being cast as an extra could catapult you into startup. It doesn't matter if you have never done anything in this industry at all. There's an avenue or a way to get into it and to learn your way and find your way. The jobs here will be good paying jobs, averaging $86,000 a year. In Atlanta, I'm Abby Kasouris. The great thing about Atlanta is it can in many ways look like many other cities, you know, add a little snow, it could maybe look like something northeast, take that snow away and change the landscape, it could look like any town USA. So there are certainly a lot of landmarks across the metro area and Lana Harris takes a look at a few of them. Respect. We are home. Black Panther. Here we go. Spider-Man. Good evening, Peter. Love it. Love it. For years, Georgians have had a front row seat to the making of major blockbuster films and TV shows. I saw Spider-Man when it um, 
when he went up in the air at Rainbow. Hey, could you do me a favor? Hold on to that. Let me tell you, the filming here is mega. Cordelia Hunter, the director at the Office of Film and Entertainment in Atlanta, says Georgia is Hollywood of the South for a good reason. Made in Georgia. We have at least 14 to 20 productions on the street daily. You know, we're all over the place. The Cornucopia Arena in the Hunger Games Catching Fire is really the Clayton County International Park. Remember the Oakland, California apartment complex at the beginning and end of Black Panther? Well, that's actually Wheat Street Towers right here east of downtown Atlanta. We've had uh, Captain America, Baby Driver, Ozark, The Walking Dead, Stranger Things. The list goes on and on and on. <laughs> We caught one production crew setting up to film in a fairly popular area of Atlanta. I can tell you it's Disney, and I can tell you it's Marvel. So our set is going to be right up on William Street. The secret production's location manager says Atlanta is a perfect backdrop to transport audiences around the world. Atlanta can look like LA. Atlanta can look like Miami. We look like London, New York. Um, and if you go outside of Atlanta, you'll get a little countryness as well. <laughs> Lana Harris, CBS 46 News. And that's and the that cool thing about our city is you can literally go so many places, so many landmarks and take pictures. And maybe some of them you'll recognize, too. I remember one time I was at the Swan House and um, that was actually used in, I think, one of the Hunger Games movies. So it is all around us everywhere. All right, so when we talk about the old General Motors plant that sat in this site um, so long ago, our very own Patrick Quinn was able to catch up with a former employee of General Motors to really talk to him about what it was like uh, working at the plant at that time and what General Motors meant to this community into Doraville and how it was just a part of the fabric here. Uh, we want to hear from him um, and really kind of see how here at Assembly Atlanta, they've woven a lot of that history into it. Um, one of the things about uh, one of the signs here on the entrance to Assembly Atlanta, that was actually the former walkway that General Motors employees used to get into the plant. That still stands here today and is being used by Assembly Atlanta. But let's head out to Patrick Quinn. He really gives us an inside look at what it was like for workers working at GM. Hank Bird started working at the General Motors plant in Doraville in 1977, 30 years after it opened. He was 19. I quit five times in my mind that night. But Hank persevered. He kept at it. Honestly, he said, because they paid a lot. My best day there was the day I started because I knew I had a means of supporting my family and uh, making a better life for us. Hank would go on to work at GM for 32 years, one of thousands who clocked in making the American automobile. And throughout the metal, tires, pistons, and paint grew friendships and families. Amidst the spark plugs, sometimes there were sparks, and on occasion, romance. This is Chuck and Carol Eitzen, now living in Duluth. Married in 1979, still married today. Yes, they met while working together at GM Doraville. Oh, and the best man? That's Rick Hurd. He also worked there. The Dorval plant at I-285 and Buford Highway produced 9.5 million cars from 1947 until it closed in September 2008. Building Monte Carlos and Chevelles when I first started, and when, I, when we ended, when, when we closed the plant, we were building the minivan. <laughs> we were building soccer, soccer mom vans. <laughs> we built 528 cars per shift typically and the line can't stop. Catrice Hatton started in the body shop around the time Hank was retiring. She didn't know Hank. She also didn't know cars. Coming from telecommunications, her tie to GM was her dad who worked there and it gave her a path up into management. It was the American dream. It's definitely the American dream that I grew up with. Definitely. Catrice stayed four years, a short stint compared to most of her colleagues, but she admits it was a formative pit stop. I'm so glad that I can say that I have had been there and I'm a better person because of it. Shortly after Catrice left, the plant closed in 2008. After 32 years, Hank retired. He says his joints are worn, his hands weathered. These days he's traded in gear shifts and gaskets for a guitar. Hank now travels the Southeast with his band. He's got that forever knack for fine tuning. 
For decades in Doraville, inside the GM plant, there were ups, plenty of downs, and along the assembly line, men, women, black, white, young and old, building cars in an unforgettable community. You're bonded around things like quality, throughput, and just the overall success of keeping the place open. You know, I just uh, feel I was extremely blessed to be able to uh, work for a company like that. And that was Patrick Quinn really taking a closer look at the General Motors plant and its impact here in Doraville and across Metro Atlanta. And when we talk about history here in the metro area, you know, you, you can't help but think what a major component the world's busiest airport is, right? When we talk about movie studios and TV studios and production here, you got to get people here and many of them come through. Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Well, one of the names on the airport is Jackson. And when we talk about Mayor Maynard Jackson, we're, we want to go back in time right now. 50 years ago, five decades ago, that's when Atlanta elected its first African-American Mayor Maynard Jackson. Our Tim Darnell takes you back in time in this latest installment of ATL Vault. <laughs> child prodigy, some would say. Um, Morehouse College um, had established an early entrance, early admittance, admittance policy, really um, in the era of the Great Depression and World War II, in part to help boost enrollment, but also because they knew that there were a number of African-American, uh, young African-American men who were ready for college before they turned the age of 18. And Maynard Jackson was one of those students. He actually entered Morehouse College at the age of 14 in 1952. And he graduated in 1956. He comes from a, a family of activists, people who were activists in terms of civil rights, um, in terms of uh, political empowerment. A generally. murder suspect off the streets uh, and, of Metro and, and Atlanta, Demetrius family, Nicholas, in frankly. custody um, days so after police I say he shot an officer back in Stone Mountain. For that, um, to, um, before the birth of Maynard Jackson, to talk about how that, his legacy, how his family's uh -huh. legacy uh, began. Uh, so uh, let's begin with his, um, his mother's family. His mother was Irene Dobbs Jackson. Irene Dobbs was the daughter, one of six daughters of John Wesley Dobbs. John Wesley Dobbs uh, was um, the unofficial mayor of Sweet Auburn Avenue. And he actually earned that title because of his activism during the civil rights movement. He was um, headquartered as the unofficial mayor of Auburn Avenue. Um, in the Butler Street Y, that was the hub of black activism um, back in the day. And the family actually lived on Houston Street in the Auburn Avenue community, quite close actually to the King family, the family of Martin Luther King Jr. In fact, Irene Dobbs grew up with Martin Luther King Jr. and his other siblings. So they were very close uh, families. And as you know, both of those families um, were um, politically active and, and, and really provided the foundation for the activism of their, of their children. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. in terms of the King family and Maynard Jackson uh, in terms of the, the Dobbs family. 
Um, but uh, in any case, they that activism uh, was really sparked by the activism of Irene's father, John Wesley Dobbs. He was uh, he was actually a, a, a postal clerk, um, a mailman. Um, uh, he rode the trains and, and oversaw the mail uh, across um, the region. But he was also the grandmaster of um, the, the Masons, the Prince Hall Masons here in Atlanta. And he was very prominent um, in, in this community and nationally, quite frankly. Uh, and with uh, a man named, an attorney named Austin Walden, he actually established the Atlanta Negro Voters League. That was a nonpartisan organization that was meant to help empower African-Americans in the city. So you see where that legacy begins there. Um, uh, Democrat uh, attorney Austin T. Walden, Republican John Wesley Dobbs established the Atlanta Negro Voters League. Um, and through that organization, through that organization, that uh, nonpartisan or bipartisan organization, they were able to galvanize the Black vote. And keep in mind that uh, Black voters in the city of Atlanta and really across the South have been disenfranchised um, early, early in the century and really beginning in the late 19th century after the end of um, Reconstruction and on into the early 20th century. Poll taxes, literacy laws uh, were put in place to limit Black voting power. And so when these two men joined forces and created this organization, um, they had a, a, a very specific purpose to galvanize that, that remaining power of the Black vote to, um, to, to really leverage um, some things in terms of uh, uh, negotiations, compromise with the white power structure. And, and, and this is uh, really during the period um, or early in the period of the Atlanta Way. Um, and that really came about initially after the 1906 Atlanta Race Massacre. And that's when members of the white power structure called in members of black leadership in the city to sit down at the table and essentially uh, go through uh, a period of compromise, negotiation, conversations um, to work toward um, change. Often it was limited change, very limited change in terms of what the black community would receive in exchange for the black vote. But it really it resulted in uh, some degree of positive change uh, within the segregated system uh, in the South. And so using this approach, this Atlanta way, the Atlanta style, some call it, um, these two men uh, and others in that organization were able to sit down at the table, literally, with uh, members of the white voting uh, voting power vote, um, power structure, and and so they were able to essentially assure that ninety nine percent of the black voters in that were part of the league that. Um, that were influenced by the league, ninety nine percent of the voters in the black voters in the city would follow the recommendations of the Atlanta Negro Voters League when they went to cast their vote. So that's a lot of of power, a lot of clout, and it speaks a lot to um, the of the integrity and the value of John Wesley Dobbs in the community. He had six daughters. He and his wife Irene had six daughters, and those six daughters were um, prominent. Um, in their own right, uh, from his uh, from Maynard Jackson Jr.'s aunt, Maddie Wilde Dobbs, who was an opera singer, internationally renowned opera star, opera singer, a diva, uh, to his aunt, June Dobbs Butts, who I had the honor of interviewing um, some years ago, about 15, 16 years ago, um, who was a prominent um, psychologist. Um, and of course, his mother, uh, and his mother, people don't realize that Irene Dobbs Jackson, um, a graduate of Spelman, all six of the daughters of John Wesley Dobbs graduated from Spelman College. And she graduated in 1929, valedictorian of her class. She studied um, in Toulouse, France um, to earn her master's degree. 
Uh, and, and that's really where she, and um, after coming back to Atlanta, she met uh, John West, uh, rather Maynard Jackson Sr., Maynard Jackson Jr.'s father. Um, now, now we're getting to the other side of the family. Uh, Maynard Jackson Sr., Reverend Maynard Jackson Sr., was actually the son of a prominent minister in Dallas, Texas. And uh, he co-pastored the church with his father for a time and then took over the pastorship of that church after his father passed in, I think, uh, 1933. But meanwhile, he was in Atlanta for a period of time working with Morehouse College on an education initiative. This is Maynard Jackson Sr. And there he met and was smitten by Irene Dobbs. They married, and actually, they flew to Par to Toulouse, France, to marry, um, and then came back to Dallas at that time. So Maynard Jackson Jr. was actually born in Dallas, Texas, uh, and then the family moved to Atlanta in 1944. Now, in, in that time frame, in, in about the decade um, between the time that Maynard Jackson was born and they moved to uh, Atlanta, Maynard Jackson senior, Reverend Manny Jackson Sr. was not only a prominent pastor, prominent minister, he was also politically active in the city of Dallas and the state of Texas. Um, he was um, a, a founder of the Progressive um, Voter, Negro Voters League. Uh, he was um, a prominent uh, activist in the NAACP. And actually, it was he uh, who was one of the leaders of the move to uh, to get the uh, to ha have the, um, the the white primary of Texas overturned. Um, they started that campaign in 1933 and finally became successful in having the white primary in Texas overturned in 1944. That uh, that was the year. Also, they moved from Dallas, Texas, the family to Atlanta. Reverend Maynard Jackson Sr. accepted um, the offer to become pastor of Friendship Baptist Church. And he, so he took that offer and brought his family here. Um, he started, he launched his career um, really by running for um, the, the seat of Herman Talmadge, um, uh, the avowed um, flagrant white supremacist. And he lost that race, of course, uh, but he was able to garner about a third of um, the, the vote, uh, one third of the vote. Um, and so he um, leveraged that um, the attention on, and the political acumen he gained while doing that um, campaign, election campaign, which he started after the, the death, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. He galvanized um, his support and then was able to parlay that and become vice mayor uh, under Sam Massell. And that's important to, to know about his, his history as well. So all during this time, he was um, getting gaining experience um, and, and really learning to negotiate um, the, the, the environment, the political environment, uh, to mu so much so that by 1973, he was able to garner the support he needed, not only Black constituents, but white constituents as well, to become mayor. Uh, and so in a city like Atlanta, where you have this history of the Atlanta way, you have this history of uh, being controlled, um, quite literally, by a white power structure um, that was made up not only of politicians, but of uh, leaders in business, uh, the economic leaders. Um, that becomes in itself an, an interesting kind of environment to negotiate. Um, Maynard Jackson was able to make uh, a, a great number of strides in terms of changes, um, in terms of uh, essentially empowering um, the Black community and other constituencies um, in, in the city. Um, but as you know, there were some controversies I'll just preface again with some of the, his accomplishments in terms of uh, really helping to build. Um, Atlanta had been trying to garner this reputation since the 1950s, really even before that, late 19th century, as um, a, a city uh, that's striving, um, that's um, symbolic or emblematic of the New South. 
um, an international city, um, and um, and it was calling itself an international city when it, even well before it actually was that, put it out there, projected that. And so in terms of building the, the airport uh, so that it could become what is now the largest uh, airport on the planet, okay, um, he really um, put those things in motion that were needed to make it so. Um, he also um, worked to enhance and, and, and actually make that more diverse the Atlanta Police Department. And, and that was something he picked up, he, that initiative to integrate the Atlanta Police Department was started by his grandfather, uh, John Wesley Dobbs and others. And so he continued that stride, that, that um, mission of making the Atlanta police force more representative of the constituency and also um, mm -hmm. ensuring that it would become a police force that was more sensitive, more humane and sensitive to the needs of the community. That was an effort. We can argue about whether that actually happened, but that was a, a major effort of his. In terms of controversy, we know that his, um, his tenure as mayor um, uh, was during the time of the missing and murdered children. That was his second tenure as, as mayor. Um, and that tore um, really almost, almost tore the city apart um, and, and polarized constituency. There was polarization even within the black community, let alone the black and white community um, and all kinds of uh, theories and ideas about what was really going on, uh, who murdered the children. Uh, and so his handling of that uh, was questioned by some uh, and there are still um, questions about whether the the person who was finally arrested and incarcerated for two life sentences is actually the person who 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 did those crimes, who killed those children, because he was arrested, Wayne Williams, for the murders of only two young men, and they were adults; they were not children. So that's another story. <coughs> Excuse me. But in addition to that, we know there was controversy around. Uh, his efforts to have John Inman fired, the police chief fired. Um, and uh, John Inman was, of course, white and had been in place for, for uh, quite a long period of time. Um, and he was able to oust him, but he replaced him with um, a college friend, Reginald Eves. And there was controversy around Reginald Eves in terms of some of his dealings in the city. Um, but in spite of those controversies, um, he, you know, what, um, in 1990, decades later, he was elected for a third term as mayor and moved forward with um, that quest of his to continue to make Atlanta an international city, brought the Olympics to Atlanta, the 1996 Olympics to Atlanta. And so, as with any politician, his life was filled with both wins and 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 misses losses near misses losses uh, and controversy. I would say that uh, Maynard Jackson, actually, his life, uh, his career, his legacy, actually helped to realize um, this this dream uh, and and this promotion of Atlanta as uh, an international city. Um, as a, a, a city that um, was the, the and continues to be to this day a uh, gateway to the South. At a time up until the time of his election, um, that um, idea of Atlanta being a city too busy to hate and an international city, gateway to the South, that was um, uh, that was a, a, a vision <laughs> that was a, a part of a PR campaign. Um, but we know that it was not actually true, okay? And even now we can argue that Atlanta has not realized its vision of becoming um, a, a true city, uh, a city that's truly too busy to hate. But what Maynard Jackson's life demonstrates is that it's possible, it's possible to make strides to get there. His election uh, proves that there was a critical mass of people, a majority of people in the electorate um, of uh, the, the voters in Atlanta who were, were willing, you know, for doing in a city that had been um, dominated by, run by um, white power structure, 
you know, over the centuries, that they came to a time that said, it's time for a change. It's time to move forward. And he embodied that vision, the accomplishments that he was able to achieve actually helped to make Atlanta truly a, a city that was international, truly a city that was uh, attempting to move forward and making it more equitable, making the environment more equitable uh, and more diverse. We still have a long, long way to go, especially in the environment that we have now where we have a lot of retrenchment, regression, uh, and polarization in terms of um, the uh, the political realm and social realm in terms of social justice. But when we look back at the, the life and career and legacy of Maynard Jackson, we have to understand we have to maintain hope. And the lesson of his life is that it is necessary to, to keep pushing. You know, that was the legacy of his grandfather's life, his mother's life. And she was uh, actually a civil rights activist, too. People don't know that. Um, and his father's life. And so just as they kept pushing for change, he continued their legacy. And it's incumbent upon um, folk in the city of Atlanta, those in politics and those not in politics, to keep pushing for the kinds of positive changes that Maynard Jackson um, wanted to achieve. That was our ATL Vault uh, look into history and a look towards the future now. As you can see, assemblies standing at the heart of Doraville, where the old General Motors assembly plant is, hence the name, uh, assembly. And as we continue our coverage here on Atlanta News First Plus, our main theme comes up again and again, the past, present, and future. So important in this discussion was we look at the past and all of the growth for the city of Atlanta, for Doraville. We look to the present and hope for a fantastic future and that's what Assembly Atlanta is bringing with 135 acres of film production, warehouses, I mean eat, sleep, uh, work environment uh, that is going to help filmmakers and industry workers take you to worlds that you can only dream of, bring characters that you've read about to life on the big screen, but also create an economic boost and a, a re rebirth for Doraville, for the housing market, as you heard, for job creation, for so many businesses. Doraville, uh, a proud small business community that is will now benefit from these efforts. And as we continue to talk about Assembly Atlanta, we have to talk about all of the people that were involved in this labor of love. Over the past year, you talk about the development, the construction, and all the physical hard work, but it also took vision. And it took the understanding the significance of the General Motor plant and the Doraville community that built itself up from that to today, to a land space of opportunity and seeing that develop time after time um, with so many hands involved in that effort to becoming this, what you see here on your screen these old relics uh, and futuristic buildings all going to be used as sound stages and sets for film production companies, but also more than that for workspaces, for retail, for so much more that 250,000 square feet of this space, this unique immersive environment is going to bring. We actually ha are going to be bringing you our Atlanta News First newscast all the way from Assembly Atlanta. Our Atlanta News First anchor and reporters are bringing you live reports from the site itself. As you can see, there's our a little behind the scenes of our desk. Uh, as you can expect, our newscast uh, to be delivering you the top stories and the latest of what's happening here in Atlanta with uh, our very own, as you just saw, Tracy Hutchins, our uh, Alan Devlin, or uh, so many others that bring you the news on a d afternoon and nightly basis. Now we're going to be taking you into Assembly Atlanta for a first hand sneak peek at all of the excitement that's building up leading up to Friday's unveiling and the moment that you get to see this wonderful creation really be used uh, to its full potential and, and 
uh, that unveiling we are excited to bring to you. Uh, we talk about all of the people involved in a project like this. You heard from CEO Michael Thurman, the Doraville mayor. We also had a chance on our morning show to speak with Brandon Reese with Motion Picture Association. Here's that interview. Well, this morning we are celebrating the completion of Assembly, a state-of-the-art movie and TV studio complex here in Doraville. And joining us here this morning is Brandon Reese, who is with the Motion Picture Association of America. He's Vice President of State Government Affairs for the Southeast Region. Thanks very much for being here. Good morning. Thank you for having me, Rick. It's a pleasure to be here at Assembly. So, so this, this is, is an exciting time for uh, Great Television, the owner of, of uh, Atlanta News First. A facility like this for the Motion Picture Association of America, what's the significance of that? This is going to be a state-of-the-art facility, as you said. I've heard Mr. Howell say it's going to be the finest facility in the world, and I don't put that past him. This is going to be a, another great attraction for major film productions in the state of Georgia, and our members Disney, Netflix, Sony, Paramount Pictures, Universal Pictures, and Warner Brothers are very, very excited about it. So you are uh, representing a, the, the sort of a trade association for all of the major studios yep. uh, that create this programming and then distribute it around the country and around the world. Um, here in Georgia, I know you've also been very involved with helping to uh, create an atmosphere, an environment where those studios want to come and do business here Absolutely, in our state. Rick. Uh, and there's been some discussion about the tax credit that is that has been credited with helping to, to sort of stir up that business. Is, is there any uh, chance that that, that credit's going to, to, to go away? So, Rick, you're right. The Motion Picture Association is the leading advocate for the, the film, the television, and the streaming industry across the world. But we do have a major focus here in Georgia. And we, along with Assembly, are members of the Georgia Screen Entertainment Coalition, who spends a, a lot of time at the Capitol working with elected officials who designed this program to do exactly what it's doing, and that's drawing in television and major film productions into the state. So for some lawmakers who say maybe it's time to scale back this tax credit and not be as generous as we've been, you would say? You know, thanks to the leadership in the governor's office, bipartisan support in the state legislature, and affiliated groups like the Georgia Department of Economic Development, we want to be able to protect this program, like, like I said, that, that has uh, been an unqualified success. Uh, from time to time, you do hear these rumors about big changes coming to shrink the program, but we want Georgia to be as well positioned as anyone else in the whole world to welcome back film productions once the strikes that you guys have done a great job covering are behind us. Brandon Reese with the Motion Picture Association of America. Thanks very much for being here. Nice to Thank meet you. you. And that was Brandon Reese with uh, Motion Picture Association. So many people involved in bringing vision to life and taking Assembly Atlanta, taking film in Georgia to the future. Um, we actually had our Atlanta News First Don Shipman out there at Assembly kind of walking in all of the cool spots and places that make Assembly Atlanta as immersive and state-of-the-art as it is. Here's more from Don Shipman. It's taking shape, right? You can actually see and see the vision that they had when they decided to do all of this. We're talking about 135 acres property here with uh, studios, 22 different sound stages here. We're inside. This is where we are going to be broadcasting live all of our newscasts this week. They're setting everything up right now, so it's kind of cool. I wanted to bring in the mayor of Doraville because this is really a huge economic boost for the city as well. Mayor Joseph Geierman. Uh, joining me here. First, let's just talk about um, this morning. You got a chance to kind of walk around and see things. What, what do you think? Well, it's amazing. I, I, the last time I was here was maybe about a month and a half ago, and just the amount of work that uh, everyone has done to get things ready has been amazing. So it's really impressive. Okay, so when, when, when the head of Gray Television uh, gave you a call and said, let's do, let's do lunch, <laughs> what, 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 what did he say, and then what did you say? Well, I, I think that what, what I came away impressed with was that they were really taken with the location. There wasn't another uh, area like this anywhere in Metro Atlanta. 130 acres inside the perimeter, uh, close access to Peachtree to Cab Airport, to I-285, 85, Beaufort Highway. It was really, uh, he had a vision for the site that um, 
you know, really, uh, I don't think anyone else had really, really seen. And so to be able to see him take that vision and run with it and build this has been amazing. And we're looking at video right now where you can actually see, you know, how it's how it's come to fruition. Um, I guess, what does this mean for this property specifically for you? Because this is an iconic piece of property. Yeah, uh, you know, Dorville was built around the former GM plant. Uh, it was a huge loss to us when uh, the plant closed in 2008. So to have this major job site open 15 years later is amazing. Uh, you know, I don't think we've really wrapped our arms around how it's going to transform the city. So, uh, so it's exciting. Yeah, there's a trickle down effect, certainly. Thank you so much yeah. for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Thank you. All right, a little sneak peek there uh, of our conversation with the mayor of Doraville. Uh, again, so many people involved in this project and not just uh, the hard work of our great television company, the vision of our CEO, Hilton Howell, but also community advocates, the mayor. You talk about CEO Michael Thurmond, uh, so many uh, people who represent the people of Doraville, and we actually had a chance to talk to the people of Doraville themselves, and they say that there was a lot of devastation after the General Motors plant closed down in 2008, a lot of job loss uh, for this small community that was greatly dependent on this assembly plant and the rebirth of that space with Assembly Atlanta brings potential for these small businesses. Uh, we actually got to catch up with CEO Michael Thurmond also on Atlanta News First this morning. Here's the conversation our anchor Gravir Dinza had with him. Uh, the new state-of-the-art studio is on the 135 acres that once used to house the old GM plant here. A lot of you remember that. And we're celebrating everything Assembly this week. Uh, the completion of Assembly here in DeKalb County joining us this morning. We've, We've got, got DeKalb, DeKalb, DeKalb County, County CEO Michael, Michael Thurman. Thurman. Great to have you with us. Delighted Michael. to be with you again. You, I know. We were here uh, a, a year ago yes. when we were in a big tent because all these buildings weren't here yet. Right? Just a big mud hole out there, right? <laughs> so when you pulled up, and, and I know you've been watching the progress over the last couple of years, when you see it now, I want to hear what your thoughts are. Amazing, transformational. Uh, Hilton Howell, Jay Gibson, are just amazing visionary leaders. And I told Hilton, it's like walking with Walt Disney in the early 1940s. This changes everything, not just in DeKalb County, but this represents a gravitational shift Mm -hmm. in the film and production industry uh, here to DeKalb County, things will never be the same again. You know, it's interesting because we, we, we talked earlier about how a lot of even universities and colleges are now offering classes, getting the next generation ready for the film and TV industry. They don't have to go, any, they don't have to go out of state anymore, do they? Not anymore. And 4,000 jobs right. here at this site that's directly created, mm -hmm. indirectly tens of thousands of others. These are huge career opportunities for current and future generations of Georgians. It's, uh, it's kind of full circle for you because you were labor commissioner back yes. when the plant here in Doraville that used to sit on this site closed. You were here when that closing happened. So it's almost like an arc, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. And I can remember the disappointment and heartbreak with generations of Georgians that worked at the Doraville plant. We closed it. But it's been a phoenix, a transformation, a rebirth of economic opportunity and development right here on this site. And I'm just proud that DeKalb County, Doraville, working with Hilton Howe and Great Communications have been able to build this partnership, public and private, right. to create jobs. Let me ask you a little bit, Michael Thurman, about, because I know I'm from Nashville, Tennessee, and I've, I've seen what happened to Nashville. It's booming, yes, right? Yes. But at the same time, you've got you to gotta have infrastructure. You've got to have all those things that come along with that boom. What does DeKalb County need to do now to really prepare for the influx of the thousands of jobs that are going to be created? Are you planning ahead? Great question, Gavir. First of all, we made the investment here, mm -hmm. uh, roughly $190 million just to support the infrastructure for this multi-billion dollar effort. Right. But we have to continue to invest in our water and sewer system, in our roads and streets. Look at this site. One of the reasons this is so phenomenal, mm -hmm. you have uh, assembly here, but you have MARTA, right. uh, a station, 285, the Department of Transportation investing nearly a billion dollars in upgrading 285 with express lanes and just a thong's throw from PDK Airport and Hartsfield. That's infrastructure. You can't build above ground 
unless you invest on the ground. Well, we're going to see what happens. Speaking of 285, I got stuck in some of that traffic and that construction this morning on the way to work. But. More like, I did too, actually. I was worried. Oh. I said, the deal will fuss at me if I'm late. So we were weaving in and out right, of right, trying right. to get here for it's you. It's short-term pain for long-term gain, right? All right. Uh, listen, a year from now, this thing's not even going to look anything like it does now. It's going to be even bigger and better. Michael Thurman, CEO of DeKalb County, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for being who you are. We are so proud of you, and you represent the very breast in broadcast journalism. Thank you much. Thank Appreciate you. We are proud of Gravier. She is she is amazing. We love her here at Atlanta News First. We love to see her out at assembly. If you're a morning news watcher, make sure to catch her tomorrow. Show your love and support by watching and tuning in uh, as she brings you your latest top stories. Hey, as we continue to talk about Assembly Atlanta, I mean, the excitement is building and so many businesses like we've just heard from DeKalb County CEO Michael Thurman, so many businesses are going to benefit from this. Our John Shipman actually talked to one Marietta business that has the opportunity to uh, be featured pretty heavily in a star-studded movie you are not going to want to miss. Well, some more than 400 movie and studio productions are produced here in Georgia each year, and those productions happen all over our state. One of those movies is uh, Reptile. It stars Benicio Del Toro and Justin Timberlake, and it just dropped on Netflix. Our own Don Shipman is live at Assembly Atlanta. Don, Reptile was shot in nearby Marietta. Yeah, it was. You know, it's a good example of the many different films and TV shows that are shot right here in Georgia. And in this case, municipalities are cashing in. So are local businesses and just regular people. This movie right here was filmed just about two years ago in October of 2021. And when you watch it, you're going to notice some of the backdrops for the scenes are in Cobb County's Marietta. Scouts for Reptile wanted a retro vibe, and they found that with the Manili Law Firm. Now, instead of a law firm, though, the building was turned into a real estate company. The production company paid to take over that property for four days. There's hardly a day that goes by in Marietta that you don't see a film crew set up somewhere. I mean, at least weekly, you know, you'll notice the little yellow signs and the arrows and the thing that, you know, indicates they're, indica they're filming somewhere. And I could probably count on one hand five people that I know uh, who have had filming either in their office or in their homes. And you can also film inside a soundstage like this. There are 22 of them here at Assembly Atlanta. Due to a non-disclose, she couldn't go into the dollar amount that the law firm earned from this, but they say that it does help to offset some costs. I also chatted with the director of Parks and Recreation there in Marietta. He says that on average, they issue about 35 permits for films and TV shows in the city of Marietta. Guys? All so right, and that was our Don Shipman. A little uh, preview, or preview, a little recap from the morning uh, on Atlanta News First uh, in our during our morning newscast. If you have a chance in the morning to catch some news with your cup of coffee, make sure to check these guys out. They keep it vibrant and energetic, and bring you the stories you really need to know about that are impacting your community, uh, community events that you'll want to tune in for, and so much more uh, on Atlanta News First. You can even watch it on your phone. Atlanta News First, uh, the app. It's free and it, we have a watch live section where you can catch our newscasts and streams like this uh, or as we continue to talk about uh, assembly atlanta the uh, excitement that continues to build uh, ahead of friday's unveiling uh, we talk about the atlanta really being central center for a lot of big movie names and i want to uh, have this moment to quiz you a little bit and see if you're familiar with a couple movies that you might have not have known were shot right here in Georgia. I got a single by this new chick named Aretha Franklin. That is R E S P E C T. Respect the movie, by the way. Uh, one of so many that were filmed here in Georgia. And uh, let's see if you know this one. This one is a little more popular. Maybe you just need someone watching your back. Hi. That 
that is none other than Ant-Man. A couple other Marvel favorites. We got Black Panther, uh, Black Widow, um, so many more. Uh, but this one really, uh, when you think about film here in Atlanta, TV shows, this one is probably the most popular. Is there any way that you could reach him? Yes. What if this whole time I've been looking for Will? I've been chasing after something else. That's right, Stranger Things, my favorite uh, thing to binge on Netflix. I actually just restarted watching the seasons as I'm waiting uh, for more. But, you know, as we talk about the film production and all the wonderful work that's coming to Doraville, um, it's important to talk about the uh, growth for Doraville. Right now, right here, Assembly, taking a look at this map, uh, you can see this is where the old General Motors plant once stood. Now it is going to be the site of the future for film, Assembly Atlanta bringing a eat, live, play workspace on a uh, 250,000 square feet site that will include anything from warehouses, film offices, uh, productions. I mean, uh, there was a point yesterday, if you were with us on Atlanta News First, where Rodney was standing in Louisiana and France and all of the wonderful places of the world uh, that we love to see. And those were all recreations, but the detail, you would think he actually went down there to do a weather report. As we continue to follow the latest excitement and all that's to come this week uh, at Assembly Atlanta, out in Doraville, and the lasting impact this project is going to have, we're going to have our anchor, Savannah Louie, uh, talk to you a little bit about the the community impact and more of the stories from our Atlanta News First team and reporters right here at Atlanta News First. We'll be right back after this commercial break. Severe weather, Atlanta's no stranger to it. Power outages, flooded streets, hail damage, we've seen it all. That's why Atlanta News First has the largest team of meteorologists in the entire Southeast. To keep watch over your street so no neighborhood is left in the dark. Seven meteorologists giving you first alerts no matter where you are. Days before a drop hits the ground, hours before the first rumble of thunder. To keep you ready for anything, this is why we first alert. This is your home for Atlanta TV. Woo! Oh. <sighs> this is Do not over top. What are we toasted to? Life. That is glistening. By Isn't it the way. beautiful? Wow. I'm the cougar. Trust me, tall glass of water women going home with me. Ah! Are you a man with two chicks and you ain't having fun? At all. Oh, yes. 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 Oh, my this is my diva day. You can't say anymore, Anthony. What would you do? What? This. <laughs> <laughs> it's all local and it's all Atlanta. Only on Atlanta's own, Peachtree TV. It's a problem every night on Atlanta roads. Drivers without lights. Now you see me, now you don't. So why does it keep happening? Atlanta News First investigates, exposing a fault in many cars that's leaving drivers in the dark. It's not careless, they have no idea. Scan this code to go directly to the story and learn why every night drivers are risking it all with lights out. Alrighty, everybody. Good afternoon to all of you here. Thank you so much for joining me here at the Atlanta News First First Alert Desk. I'm Savannah Louie, anchor and reporter for Atlanta News First. So thrilled to be here to share a little bit about one of the most exciting projects I think our parent company, Gray TV, has been working on uh, now for a couple of years. We're talking about Assembly Atlanta today. And if you've joined us for any of our newscasts or even streaming here right now, I know uh, Maria was up here a little bit earlier sharing about all of the good stuff going on uh, up in Doraville. But we are just thrilled to, to be a part of what's going on and glad that we can share it with you. Uh, this is not only a massive film studio, uh, Assembly 
Assembly Atlanta. But when we say Assembly Atlanta, we're talking about much, much more than that. The property, which by the way is 135 acres of land. I'll see if I can pull up some video here so you can kind of get a visual. Uh, but it's not just the film studios. We're also talking about sound stages. We're talking about uh, a number of uh, other things, including a uh, mixed use development. Um, there are plans for a restaurant uh, restaurants to be uh, in, in the works as well, um, along with hotels, conference spaces, and so much more. What you're looking at here is just part of the construction that we have uh, that, that's that been going on here for the past couple of years now, just for a little bit of uh, back history here, Gray TV. Again, that's our parent company. They acquired the property back in 2021. Since then, there have been a number of procedures that have gotten us to where we are today. Um, and you can see some of it happening right here. Ultra fast forward there. Uh, for example, in December 2021, that last warehouse that was previously on the site was removed. Then they brought in all of these construction workers to create all of these other structures, buildings, future movie sets, really exciting stuff. You know, I was out there yesterday evening. We're doing some of our newscasts out there. Um, just to kind of get everybody in the spirit of what's going on uh, over at Assembly Atlanta. Um, so if you join us tonight at 10 o'clock on Peachtree TV on the CW, you'll see me out there with Alan Devlin. We'll be sitting at a remote anchor desk. So our typical studio here in Midtown, that's going to be pretty empty except for a meteorologist. And it'll be Alan and I out there again at 10 o'clock this afternoon or, or this evening, rather, uh, broadcasting live from Assembly Atlanta. So if you look beyond us, you can kind of get a, a view of all of the exciting things that are unfolding. You know, it's crazy. For example, one of the things that we, we saw in the background of our shots last night were people still working at 10 p.m. on uh, getting the whole property, the whole facility, all, all ready to go uh, before its grand opening. Now, if you join us for any of our afternoon newscasts starting at 3 o'clock this evening or this afternoon, you're going to see all of our anchors out there. And not only that, you're going to see some really cool stories from our entire Atlanta News First team. We've had entire crews of reporters, photographers, anchors working so hard on bringing you people of Atlanta not only to Assembly Atlanta, but also giving you a, a inside behind the scenes peek at the film industry here in Georgia. And we're going to go through some of those stories right now because they're simply fantastic. Speaking from a reporter perspective here, it's not that often that we reporters really get to hone in and work on a story over the course of several days, unless you're on the investigative team. So if I know for a number of our reporters, we got the chance to look at one specific topic and really dive really deep into it, uh, which I think ultimately all of us reporters and anchors really enjoy doing. But it also, I think, in my opinion, makes the stories uh, really just pop. So I'm excited to share these with you right now. Uh, we are going to go first to our Tory Cooper. Now, I mentioned earlier in our streaming just a couple of minutes ago that Assembly Atlanta, it's not just the movie studios or the film studios, but there are also sound stages on the property. I was in one of them last night. I, I, I snuck in before our uh, 10 p.m. show. And it's pretty cool. This structure is huge. And the sound is pretty fantastic. And from here, I'm going to let our Tori Cooper take us inside one of those sound stages. I'm Tori Cooper, and right now, I'm 51 feet up in the air. Thankfully, I'm not afraid of heights, because out here at Assembly Studios, production crews are going to have all of the amenities that we get to show you. So tonight, we're talking all about the fact that crews, when they come here to shoot a movie or just create anything, they will be able to do it on a soundstage like this. A soundstage? What is that? So a purpose-built soundstage, you know, really is designed for the folks that come here and create content to make a workflow that's repeatable and reliable and gives us elements of control, one of which is in the name, sound. So you can tell just we were on an active construction site moments ago. We come in here and it's dead. This catwalk allows crews to control light and power to the set in a safe environment. We've got tilt panel concrete walls, so 14 inch thick concrete. And then we have a series of, of, of layers of insulation that go interior and on the roof 
and it really deadens the sound so you can't there's no echo there's no nothing in here from up there to down here you are in full control if you gotta let everyone know it's quiet on the set you're gonna use your bell and light system there are 19 different sound stages at Assembly Studios. Each one is different in size, but this one is equipped with eight different hair and makeup rooms, and there's even office space. And outside, you can be somewhere completely different. We're in the French Quarter, y'all. Take a look. This is just one of the many different facades that they have here at Assembly Studios. Down the way, there's also a facade recreating Tribeca, New York a brownstone in New York, and even a trip to Europe. And this is only one small part of the bigger picture out here at Assembly Studios. I'm Tori Cooper, Atlanta News First. That was awesome, wasn't it? Tori was all over. <laughs> we saw her in the French Quarter, uh, Tribeca, and of course here in uh, Metro Atlanta, right? But all of that really happening at Assembly Atlanta in Doraville. Uh, I know she had an awesome time with that package too, with that story as well. So glad that we could uh, talk about that today. I think a lot of people, you know, you might hear about soundstage, you know, that they're utilized for productions, but you don't really think about all of the effort that goes into creating something like that. And that's something that, you know, again, we've been tracking now for a number of years, for a couple of years now, and it's so exciting to see it finally come together. And just to also recognize how huge it is. I mean, you saw Tori in that room. It, it was huge, right? And so again, this is just one of the many structures on the 135 acre property over in Doraville. All right, guys, I want to move on. This might be my personal favorite story of the day, so. I thought about saving it for last, but you guys are in for a treat. If you're joining us right now, um, one of my favorite things about any sort of production, whether it's a movie or TV show or even reality TV, let's be honest, um, it's what people are wearing. You know, you can really communicate or convey a message to someone, your audience, based off of what you're wearing. And I'm not just talking about, okay, pants and a t-shirt, right? You're talking about accessories. You're talking about the little details that end up making such a big difference. Even makeup is part of it, right? It's pretty incredible to see. And the folks who are behind costume design are so incredibly creative. This isn't the kind of thing where, you know, they, they wake up one day and they just have one idea and they throw clothing on the character, right? It's a work in progress. There's a whole procedure to it. And it's pretty interesting. From here, I'm going to let our anchor, Lana Harris, explain a little bit about uh, the costume design and how it's impacted here in Georgia. You may think you love clothes. But Marcella Caudill is no ordinary shopper. And this is no ordinary clothing store. We are at Cali Collection in Norcross. They have everything. Everything. Shoes, socks, jackets, dresses, accessories, shirts, belts. From every decade dating back to the 1920s. I want all of these. Caudill says this is basically her playground because she's okay. a costume designer. Every piece can tell a story and you can create a million different characters. Her job is to find looks for actors, whether they're security, housewives, or children in any era. So when you say teacher, you know, you see teacher. You may wonder how someone so young knows what was fashionable decades before she was born. Let's go to the 60s. Cadell says they have yearbooks and catalogs from stores like Sears, seemingly dating back to the beginning of time. Little cropped boxy tops, crochet knits, and it can kind of help you build the character. She's helped style big names like Laura Dern, Aldous Hodge, and Charlie Day, and possibly some of your favorite movies with clothes from this very location. All Eyes on Me, which was like 90s Tupac movie. I worked on The Founder, which was the McDonald's 60s film. Hidden Figures, which was 60s. She says finding multiple looks for an entire cast takes a full team of people because the process is intensive. If you see an actor wearing a white t-shirt, Seven, at least seven people have touched that t-shirt. But Cadill says it's all worth it watching the actors morph into their character before their eyes. It helps tell the story and become the person they need to be for the script. That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Again, that was one of my favorite stories of the day. Uh, I think partially because I like clothes. 
<laughs> so that might be uh, my bias coming out there. But, you know, it also is really interesting to think about all of the people who, you know, Lana mentioned it, all the people who go into creating one outfit, one costume, right? At times, seven people touching a T-shirt before the, the character, the person, the actor wears it. That's a lot of people. And, you know, maybe I'm being, um, maybe I'm drawing trying to, I don't know, draw too big of a line here, but I feel like there's a really big similarity when you look at that teamwork when it comes to the costume design and then also the teamwork that really has come into Assembly Atlanta as a whole. I want to show you now, uh, let's take another look at this at uh, the, the construction here of Assembly Atlanta. This is a project that, again, has taken a couple of years, and even though the work is almost done, we're very nearly to the end here, there are still going to be so many opportunities when it comes for jobs and ultimately that's going to bring more people to the Doraville area. Okay, so just to give you a little bit of background information here, Assembly Atlanta is expected to create thousands of jobs. This is going to provide opportunities for local talent and in turn supporting the local communities. I think no matter where you are in the metro Atlanta area, that is something that we are excited to see, right? All right, I want to see if I can pull up a story by our Adam Murphy. Okay, I see it uh, right here. Adam Murphy talks a little bit about the history of this plant. If you're not familiar with Assembly Atlanta's history, I know uh, Maria, who was on here about 15 minutes ago, she went over this a little bit, but Assembly Atlanta is formerly the General Motors plant. It was a pretty big hit to the Doraville community and DeKalb County when that plant closed. Suddenly, thousands of workers were no longer commuting to Doraville. Businesses suffered. The community suffered. It was like there was this huge gaping hole in the community. But Assembly Atlanta, which will later bring a mixed-use facility that will one day open the public, open to the public, really aims to bring more people back to the area. And that's where I'm going to let Adam Murphy Take it from here. In the city of Doraville, there is a hustle and bustle of traffic on Buford Highway at 285. But if you spend any time here, you'll quickly realize something is missing. Really, Doraville grew up around that GM plant, so when it left, that was a, a major loss for us. Doraville Mayor Joseph Garman said life changed here when the General Motors plant shut down 15 years ago. Hundreds of jobs vanished, and so did the people, leaving a gaping hole in the heart of the city. There was actually a lot of business that was lost. Justin Tate is the general manager of Baldino's Sandwich Shop in town. He said his store lost about 40% of its lunch business after the closure of the GM plant. There were people that would come in and say, hey, you know, this is probably my last time coming here. I'm no longer working across the street. Now, for the first time in more than a decade, there is a new heartbeat that will soon bring opportunities and life back to Doraville. But I do think property values are going to go up and we will see um, increased revenue based on that. Great Television's new development, Assembly Atlanta, will bring a new live, work and play studio city to the old GM site, giving new businesses in town a sense of hope. We're just looking forward to more foot traffic, uh, economic growth, new jobs, etc. I mean, it's just a win-win for everybody. But I think the assembly is going to offer a lot of new opportunity and growth, and we're really excited about it. The mayor told me that Assembly Atlanta is expected to generate more than 3,500 new jobs, more than making up for the 800 or so that were lost. The heartbeat is back and the future is bright here in Doraville. At Assembly Atlanta, Adam Murphy. Atlanta News First. I love that story. I feel like for me personally, it gives me so much optimism, uh, not just about where we are right now, but about where we're going when it comes to the film industry in particular. Uh, I've heard so many people <laughs> refer to, you know, we know Georgia is the Hollywood of the South. I've, I've heard so many people over the course of the past several weeks refer to this as Yollywood, which I think is hilarious. I don't know if you've heard that before, uh, but I, I just think it's really, um, representative of where Georgia is going to be um, and you know where we already are we're already owning that Hollywood of the South title you can see it in the productions that we've done here in Georgia and the ones that are scheduled to continue here in Georgia all right guys uh, 
I know Adam touched on this briefly. I mean, his story was really about uh, some of the opportunities and where we've been when it comes to the community. But I think one of our other reporters, Abby Kasoris, does a really good job at giving us a little more insight into the job creation aspect of Assembly Atlanta. In particular, Assembly Atlanta, yes, we know it's going to create thousands of jobs, but we're going to focus here on the specific jobs that it has and will continue to create. And when you think about jobs, you might, this might not be the first thing that comes to your mind, but it's pretty important. And this has been a huge part of Assembly Atlanta. We're talking about, well, I don't want to give too much away. I'll just let Abby take it from here before I, before I tell her whole story before we even air it. <laughs> All right, here's our Abby Kasoris. It, it's no small feat. Building Georgia's largest production studio took countless hours of hard work. All of the steel was fabricated right here in Scottsdale, Georgia. 13,000 pieces, 12,000 tons, enough to fill 600 trucks. Every beam, truss, and column was created here at Steel LLC. In Each piece is carried by overhead cranes to conveyors to saw and drill lines before getting a fresh coat of paint. Robert Miller is one of 150 employees working overtime to make the project happen. We got to put everything on there and clean it up, paint it, and get it out of here. After decades of work, he says the assembly project is one of the biggest he's been a part of. I tell my kids, hey, your daddy was proud of that. The company has been in business since 1947, working on the World of Coke Museum and Falcon Stadium, but Rob Williams says the assembly project put them on the map. It really just having a steady flow of work for such a long time frame, you know, it's a good sense of job security for everybody. At a time when work was drying up, they were adding workers. More than 1,000 construction jobs were added for the project, and job creation doesn't stop there. Third Rail Studios and Assembly expect 4,000 freelance jobs, including production crews, operators, and extras. This is the best place in the world to become an actor. You might recognize Brian Beagle from the film We Are Marshall. The actor is now a casting director. The movies here are huge now, so the opportunities are a lot bigger as well. Background actors average more than $17 an hour. Being cast as an extra could catapult you into stardom. It doesn't matter if you have never done anything in this industry at all. There's an avenue or a way to get into it and to learn your way and find your way. The jobs here will be good paying jobs, averaging $86,000 a year. In Atlanta, I'm Abby Kasoris. Over there, it's meant to look like the French. Yeah, that was a pretty cool one, wasn't it? Uh, I also spoke to Abby that day uh, when she got back from doing that story, and she had a blast with that. I think that's, again, one of the things that our reporters have really enjoyed doing is having the opportunity to go out there and really dig deep into these stories. The film industry in Georgia, that's, that's been a major story because it impacts our economy, it impacts communities, jobs, all sorts of entertainment opportunities as well. So, I mean... I think a lot of us have had a, a blast out really working on these stories and seeing, um, you know, what we can do to offer more information about the film and entertainment industry here in Atlanta. All right, guys, we are going to switch things up here, though. I've had a blast sharing about Assembly Atlanta and some of the exciting opportunities that are going to be coming to Doraville and the entire Metro Atlanta and the entire state as a result of uh, Assembly Atlanta. But we do have some news to get to today. So we are going to go, if I can pull this up, we are going to start doing, um, I want to get us, okay, here we are, perfect. I want to get us up to speed on some of our top breaking stories that we've had today. Uh, and we're going to start with this one right here. This is coming to us out of Atlanta, Georgia, a murder suspect who capture or who opened fire on cab deputies has been captured. This is according to officials. The man that you're looking at here, Nicholas Demetrius Earl. He is again a murder suspect. He allegedly opened fire on DeKalb County deputies last week. He was captured today in Douglasville. That's according to police, without any incident. 
Officials say that they responded to the area of Juliet Road around 3 p.m. on October 13th. This was last week, searching for the murder suspect. Again, Nicholas Demetrius Earl. He allegedly fired at deputies before fleeing into the woods. Police say the wooded area was searched and Demetrius Earl was not found. This happened in a very small Stone Mountain community. The community has been on edge over the past several days, worrying about where this person could be. It is a little bit unnerving, isn't it? But again, earlier today, Earl was captured. And just as an aside, he was originally wanted in connection to the June death of 34-year-old Timberry Mims. We have information on both of those stories on AtlantaNewsFirst.com. You can go to our website or our app right now to get the very latest. All right, guys, I want to go ahead to another national pretty big story that's happening right now out of our nation's capital. Representative Jim Jordan trying to become the next Speaker of the House. Let's see if we have any pictures. No, no pictures. All right, we'll show this video. One moment, please. All righty. So here's what you need to know about this story. Um, there have been 20 Republicans who have failed to support the GOP nominee, Jim Jordan, in his quest for the U.S. House speakership bid. This happening just earlier this afternoon. Jordan is an Ohio Republican. He has been a fierce critic, by the way, of Fulton County DA Fonnie Willis's uh, indictment of former President Donald Trump. But again, he lost that bid to become the new House Speaker. When the vote came in, in a tally from the House floor, 20 Republicans cast votes for other colleagues, ensuring Jordan would not win on the initial ballot. So where do we go from here? Well, the answer is we're not really sure. The House immediately went into recess after Tuesday's final tallies. We're still waiting to hear if another vote is going to be scheduled. And this is a developing story. All of this again coming after former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy was ousted from his position just several days ago. All right, guys. And I do want to get to one final story here. This is a pretty positive one, I believe. All right, what you're looking at here, and yeah, this is a good story. I'm glad that we can end things on this note. We have a city commission honoring a Decatur student whose quick thinking led to an arrest of a hit and run suspect. A Decatur High School student received a community service award during the Decatur City Commission meeting yesterday for helping the police department identify the suspect who hit a school crossing guard in September. You're looking at her right here on the left, Tessa Hibner, with her community service award from Police Chief Scott Richards during that meeting. Now, guys, we have more on this story along with all of our other content for you. You can find it all on Atlanta News First or the Atlanta News First app. And from here, guys, we have our 3 p.m. newscast coming up here in just a bit. I believe we have our Tracy Hudgens and Carly Barnett who are going to be taking us to Assembly Atlanta. They're going to be broadcasting live for us out there, giving us a, another peek at what's going on up in Doraville. And they're going to have even more content, not only with our reporters uh, and our photographers talking about the fantastic area, but also the news of the day, everything that you need to know before you turn in for uh, the rest of your evening here. All right, guys. Thank you so much for joining us. I am going to send things out to Assembly Atlanta as we say goodbye here. Just a little behind the scenes preview of uh, what we can expect over at the 135 acre property over in Doraville. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you at three.